peace. Greetings to you all. It's your brother Naheem, BKA Lord Abba, aka Mr. Just the Facts. And you know, we got BTP Ali on deck in the building. Be the power is in the building. What's good, bro? Peace. What's going on? Peace. You know, we, we're going to get into some things tonight. Um, let's let's give a shout out to everybody in the chat so far. Um, DP, the OG Arthur Ward, good looking for the super chat. Let's keep this going. Absolutely, brother Cato. Peace, brother Arthur Ward. Peace, Cato. Peace, Man, Riri. In Texas in the house. BTP Riri is in the building. He said, "Peace and love to the free." Peace, peace and love to the free man. Abdul Sharif asks, what are the most constructive results? I don't really understand the question. But um, what? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So what I want to do, I want to send this. I meant to send this. I want to send this video to Sarnetta. Because mm. I want him to, to um, you know, check it out and see if we, you know, if we could get this debate going because a lot of the people on on Sarnetta's channel who have come up through that channel view Garvey as a demigod that should be worshipped. And, and don't get me wrong, being a former member of the Morris Science Temple of America, I, you know, we have reverence for Garvey as well. And we're going to speak to some of that tonight. But first, family, make sure y'all hit that like button. Share this video out. If you are not a member, or excuse me, if you are not subscribed to the channel, you can subscribe by hitting the subscribe button. Hit that little bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you can become a part of the Notification Nation um, membership. You can be a member of the channel. I hear some feedback a little bit, Ali, that was coming from your end, I think. Oh, yeah, I'm muted out on. Yeah, I'm muted out on YouTube. But um, you know we, <laughs> the bros, was, was going in one morning. I was listening in. I couldn't chime in the way that I wanted to. This particular live stream is long overdue. We did a critique on Elijah Muhammad. And we did a critique on Malcolm X, we did a critique on Noble Drew Ali. And the reason why I feel that these critiques are important, peace, brother Charlie, peace, sister April, uh, blessings and peace to Bulatoni Bula Lulama Bay, is because it, it shows us how to move forward in the future it dispels a lot of myths it moves us out of man worship basically because that's what a lot of this is is, is man worship and when i was mm -hmm. in the Moorish science temple of america it was one of the claims that i would make one of the critiques that i would have of the membership yo y'all worship noble drew ali man i was like you know i, I have reverence for the man and what he did but Y'all dudes worship this dude. Like, come on. You know, and they didn't like me because I didn't follow along in their man worship. But that brings us here today because Garvey called, I mean, excuse me, Noble Drew Ali called himself a Jesus type of figure. And he called Garvey his John the Baptist, the harbinger and the forerunner, right, Ali? So, mm -hmm. you know, before you get in and we get into the you know, the nuts and bolts of this thing. You want to go in on anything? Or you could just jump right in. <laughs> you you muted, bro. My bad. Just speaking to the point of um, man worship, I, I would just say, just kind of, you know, reiterating what we were talking about on the phone. Uh, one of the problems that our people have is that we deify men. We put these men on certain pedestals. And once we do that, 
they can't be wrong. There's nothing that they could say or do that could be wrong or even critiqued, you know, uh, or criticized in any kind of way. But what we come to find out, the truth of the matter is that all of these people were just men and they were actually flawed, flawed human beings, you know? And, and I think it's a learned behavior. It's like, I, I also use the term Messiah complex. Um, it, it to me, cause that's what it's like. It's like we, our people did the same thing with Barack Obama. Um, so much so to the point that even though people knew deep down inside that he really didn't do anything for our folks. You can't say anything about him to many black people without it turning into a fight. You know what I'm saying? Like it really literally turns into, you know, a, a fight. So it's like people like him, Michelle Obama, who, who made some very problematic statements in her book um, about Jeremiah Wright, about George Bush being her partner in crime and, you know, to me, those kinds of things were problematic. The way they turned their, the way she and Barack, in my opinion, turned their back on uh, Jeremiah Wright. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, she wrote about know. it real quick, Ali. Yeah. In her book, uh, what's the name of her book? Becoming or something like that. I mean, yeah, she whatever. dissed Jeremiah Wright, basically called him a dinosaur and old relic of, of times gone by, I paraphrase. While showing right. a lot of love to 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 George, George Bush. W. Bush. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, peace. What's good on cold, brother? Peace. What's going on, Tyrone? Tyrone Davis, Davis. Building, Vince Jefferson, BB Rodriguez, Vayasa Nicola Guller. Mm -hmm. Going in. Yeah, go ahead, Ali. Yeah, so I mean, we've done that with everybody from Barack to we see that going on with polite, even at this point. Uh you know, there are people who are caping for polite right now, you know, mm -hmm. to even even to this point, even though charges have been upgraded on this guy, you still got people trying to defend him, you know, um, to the point where they'll they will try to put down the young girl and the young girl's mother as you know, as if it was whatever happened was their fault. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you see that you've seen that with polite's teacher. Imam Esau or Dr. York, you've seen that with him being put on a pedestal where people want to deny the claims of many of the members who, who, who said that he sexually abused them or their children or whatever the case, do that with him. They do that with Minister Farrakhan. You can't, you can't criticize Minister Farrakhan, man, without, a, without those guys pretending like they want to come and see you or something. <laughs> criticize them. And we oh, have. yeah. <laughs> and we we have, you know what I mean? But you know, those those guys are known, they're good for trying to threaten people away from criticizing um Farrakhan or Elijah Muhammad, you know, or yeah, WD Fard, and you know. Oh, yeah, yeah the, you speak like that to the dear holy apostle. The dear holy apostle. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Dr. York, Farrakhan, you know, um you name WD it. W.D. Fard, <laughs> Drew Ali, mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Garvey. You can't, to the to the Pan-Africanist, Afrocentrist, you can't say anything about Garvey. You can't, man. They're going to turn into a fight. Bro. And it's going to be a, become a thing where it's like, you don't know history. You people don't read. And this is what happened because, you, you know, you know that's one of the, these people's go-to lines is you don't read. So anytime you you don't agree with them on something, it's because you don't read. Mm -hmm. That's what it that's what it comes down to. <laughs> so in any case, man, Garvey is another one. You know, he's been put on a pedestal. And for many people, he could have done no wrong. And so, but nothing could have been further from the truth. Nothing could have been further from the truth. He he said and did as each of the other ones, some very problematic things. Yeah, you, you can get called a coon, definitely, Cato. In, in some cases, you can get called a coon for, for speaking about Garvey in an unfavorable way, you know, definitely, definitely. So I guess, you know, we'll cover some of, we'll, we'll go into some of the problematic statements tonight 
and, um, you know, talk about some of the things that Garvey said and did that were problematic and what we deem as mission drift, if you will. Where's Brother Grim? Grim coming? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, there you go. There you go. Okay. Peace, Grim Friedman. What's going on? A.K.A. the Urban Mystic. What's good, bro? Hey, peace, peace, y'all. Yes, what What's the deal, sorry, Grim? Sorry I'm late. I don't know how much y'all covered, but uh, I had some stuff I had to take care of. And I said, late, let me hurry up and get in the building, you know. But yes, I, I don't know how much I missed. Well, I was just really kind of going over what we were talking about on the phone, which is how our people seem to have a problem with deifying and, and, and um, you know, exalting people to these God statuses on earth, man. And, and we've done it with so many different people from Barack Obama all the way back, you know, all the way back to Drew and, and Garvey and you name it, man. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over when the fact of the matter is we're just dealing with human beings and, you know, human beings are flawed. Word. And, you know, I, let me let me just make to another statement like this was hard for me, man, because y'all know, you know, we come from like a bunch of schools, the same schools as, of uh, thought, the same schools of uh, of knowledge, you know. So uh, and Garvey was like basically like central to like all those different schools of uh, basically, you know, all of those different schools of thought, man. So. You know, this one, bro, is like a hard one for me, man. But, you know, after we broke some of the things down and we basically did the research, you know, we basically realized, man, that, you know, this this go hurt a lot of people. A lot of people go be mad with us and stuff like that because this dude is central to a lot of Pan-African thought, ideology, and, and even non-Pan-African thought. But, you know, the mm -hmm. bottom line, man, is that <clears throat> it, it is mission drift. And, I, and I'm pretty sure we go get into it. Because they had freedmen, you know what I'm saying? The freedmen in that day and time were basically on deck, like doing the work, doing the political and, and the civil uh, work to get things done, you know? And, and you know, I know we're going to get into it. And we basically discovered that 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 Mr. Garvey was like, uh, like you say, mission drift from the work that the freedmen had to do in America. Not just mm -hmm. Garvey. Not just Garvey. Not just Garvey, yeah. right. There were many others. You know, we, we, we give our credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. But Garvey is, his position and his plan for black Americans was extremely problematic. So much so that the people that worked with him other people from the Caribbean, whom I'm going to bring up, one of the giants, uh, to me, an intellectual giant from back in that day. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to see where we're going to start this. So I'm trying to find the Garvey quotes. I, well, I there was one, the brother, um, the brother Ty Harper. Yeah, I got that one, but I'm looking that for one? the okay. other one where he there we go, right there. The the origin of the the, the flag. So mm, if okay. you, if you mm -hmm. I mean, let, let me. Oh, so let's let's do this real quick, right? Mm -hmm. We we basically had a conversation about. It wasn't just Garvey. It was Noble Drew Ali. It was Elijah mm -hmm. Muhammad. It was Father Devon. It was uh, Sweet Daddy Grace, and. While they brought us something, and I, you know, I spoke to this to the fellas, right? That made us poke our chests out. It made us say that we're gonna stand on our own two feet. Damn this white man and and his brutalizing us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It abdicated the responsibility of the freedmen to move forward as a political group in the United States of America. And that's one thing that another Caribbean who came here spoke to. So I'm trying to think how are we going to get into this? Let me give some more shout outs real quick. Peace. Miss Battle. My brother Dre is in the building. Um, Outside the cube. Said good stuff on Sarnetta last night. 
even though you were terrible at the evolution part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, they was a hey, they was trying to get me to come on the, the other channel, but I had I had to go to sleep. I had to go to sleep, so I I, I couldn't go get into their um into their debate. I know I I peeped them trying to set me up though. Let's get Ab over here. We are gonna do them like old stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, who else is it? Sister Constance. What up, y'all? What's good, fam? Get your hand out my all the family. Says, should it be you? <laughs> I guess you know we're replacing the old false prophets, and we're gonna set ourselves up to be the new false prophets. I don't know if that's what that means, but it is what it is. Get your hands out my pocket. <laughs> I, I got a rhyme, and and then uh, the bars that say, get, "What I said." I'm at the auto barn like L. Hodge, flank, flank with two shooters. Get your hands out my pocket, hit them with skyrockets, cook them like hot pockets. I'll microwave the brave. We different Malcolms in this day and time. So um, anyway, Robert Reed, peace. So somebody said, what's the problem with the flag? Come with it. We're going to come with it. So I, I want the bros to go in and y'all can... You know, y'all set it off, and I'll, I'll jump in and interject with with um, you know, unless y'all want me to start with the flag. I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, go go with the flag. Let's start right, with let's, the flag, and then we can go into the comments, okay. some of the comments and other things. Okay, cool. Let let's do that real quick. Let us do that real quick. So, let me see. Let me see. Do 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 do. Cause I don't want to pull. Oh, I did not just do that. It went all the way back to the damn beginning. All right, go ahead, bro. <laughs> okay, so so let's 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 do. Um, let's start with the one Ty Harper, brother Ty Harper gave us the other day. I mean, I had heard this, you know, circulating around for a while, mm -hmm. but it was uh. You know, I I'd never read it myself. I have it. Did you want you want to pull it up? Yeah, I have Dr. it. It's a, it's a it's a a letter from 1925, August 8th, mm -hmm. um, 1925. Marcus Garvey to Ernest S. Cox. So we starting with the flag, yo. Well, well I, I couldn't. Uh, no, no, wait, hold, I, on. I, I, hold on, hold I got on. Some interference. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, I, everything sound clear on my end, though. All right, I'm gonna fall back. I gotta pull this up, though. My 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 bro Dre said, "Lord Abba, your freestyle was better than the Magi ball." Yeah, we were spitting <laughs> we on Starnetta last night. No, oh, man, I'm a little amp right now. My pen, my pen just uh, woke up out of its slumber early this morning and, and, and just start scribbling across some paper. But anyway, <laughs> um, y'all go ahead. Um, so, all right, so all right, did you, you get a share screen? Okay, yeah, let me know. Can you see it? There we go, bro. All right, so let me know if it's big enough. Or should I make it larger? Uh, yeah, I guess you can make it a little bit larger, but I think that's good. That's good. All right, mm -hmm. so basically, this is a letter from Garvey to Ernest S. Cox, and I really just kind of wanted to look at the the last part, you you know, whoever wants to read it can read it for for context. But one of the things that he said that was, um, in, in my opinion, um, pr problematic is what he said his in terms of his feelings about the so-called Negro. Um, and you can all see it; it's kind of highlighted. The last sentence: the fact is that the modern Negro is a lazy good-for-nothing slumberer. This is my conviction arrived at by close and careful study and experience. And if something is not done for him, he will die as other unfit races have. Mm. That sounds clannish to me. Now, my thing is, he has... He's talking from experience, his experience at this point in time is with American so-called Negroes, American blacks, right? Because he's in America. This is in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm assuming at this point he's he's locked up, 
right? I'm assuming I don't know what what year he gets locked up. Maybe you know Grim exactly I when think, that was. Yeah, he's probably locked up at this time because I think he gets locked up. In, and it's the penitentiary in Georgia. In the penitentiary, that's right. So, and maybe he's angry, or or whatever, at you know because of 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 uh, you know the 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 maneuvers, the boys and 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 uh, a Philip Randolph and those guys you know, started to, started to maneuver against him. Um, but, and so maybe he's angry, but the fact of the matter is to me, this is a problematic statement. The fact is that the modern Negro is a lazy, good for nothing slumberer. This is my conviction arrived at by close and careful study and experience. And if something's not done for him, he will die as un other unfit races have. So I'm going to stop sharing it. Y'all guys can see it. You can find it. Marcus Garvey to Ernest Cox, P.O. Box 733, Atlanta, Georgia, August 8th, 1925. You can read the rest of it if you think the context is off. If you want to put it in some other kind of context. But to me, this is pretty clear. It's, a, it's an emphatic statement based on, like he said, his experience and careful study of the so-called Negro. So let me, let, me, let me stop sharing that and talk about that for a minute. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I see people doing uh, on social media, and this is related to what he just did, is use right wing talking points. Right now, that to me sounds like something that Candace Owens, you, you, you could hear a Candace Owens saying this. You could hear a Larry Elder. You could see you, you can hear um, a Herschel oh. Walker. Thomas, Say, Sowell. Thomas Sowell saying this kind of a thing, right? And these are really racist talking points. And not only is that a ra is something like that a racist talking point that comes from the minds of white people who created what they call the so-called Negro problem, but at the end of the day, what this really is is racial profiling, because he didn't say some Negroes or a handful of people that I dealt with, or there were some people up there in Harlem that just wasn't right and they didn't they didn't understand how to do things or whatever. He said the modern Negro, and he's talking about African Americans, he's talking about native freedmen, is a slumberer, good for nothing, yada yada yada. Now to me, that's racial. I mean, when you do stuff like that, it's tantamount to racial profiling. And this is what he did. And to me, that's a problematic statement, along with some of the other things that he said that people um, at that time, when you look at the writings of, of, of people like A. Philip Randolph and Du Bois and, you know, some of the other brothers, he kind of aligned himself with the Ku Klux Klan. You know, and we're going to go into that, but y'all can add on to that. This, this, so that was just my opinion about that particular piece. Shout out to Brother Ty Harper, um, you know, and um, other freedmen in the building. So y'all can add on to that if you want. Peace. Indeed, man. I, I would like to add on to. Oh, definitely, go ahead, Grim. To um, I mean, that wasn't the uh, that wasn't the only problematic uh statement. You know, um, if you get. Uh, a book called Marx Garvey Message to the People, The Course in African Philosophy, which was basically a, uh, it was edited by Tony Martin. And uh, there's two versions of it, but I have Message to the People, The uh, Course in African uh, Philosophy. And basically that's like the lessons. When, once he was exiled to give people like a background on the lessons, that once he was basically exiled from the United States of America, he went to Canada and got as close as he could to the United States and basically called uh, all of the leaders that he trusted so he can basically give them his lesson. So in the message to the people, and um, I'm hold on, I'm going to pull it up so I could... Uh, um, get the list but uh if i can't find it it's in the message to the people but in the list of of reasons because i know we put it in the inbox too and 
his course of African philosophy or school of African philosophy, some of the points of the purposes of the UNIA, right? Um, and y'all know where I'm going with this. He basically, one of those points, he said that the purpose is to go back to Africa and civilize the backwards uh, savage or the backwards oh, yeah. uh, oh, African, yeah. you know, which basically, you know, shows that, you know, he had like a low idea and a low opinion, you know, of, of the people on the African continent as well. So I'm trying to, if you brothers can pull that up, but I'm I've just pulled the book off the shelf. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying, trying to, to find it. And we're not saying that everything the brother di uh, uh, did was was bad, but they basically gave the reasons of why the the, the UNIA um uh what what was his purpose? And the basically the purpose was to civilize the uh it was called the aims and objectives of the uh, the UNIA. Um, and it says to promote uh, conscientious spiritual uh, worship amongst the native in Africa, native tribes in Africa. So basically, you know, I guess putting Christianity uh, uh, on them as well. But I think I'm, I'm pretty close to that um, to that quote. So if y'all could bear with, with me for a second. No, definitely. so number five in the aims and objectives of the uh UNIA, uh Marcus Garvey basically said um to assist in civilized civilizing the backwards tribes in Africa, you know. So, you know, he didn't really believe, you know, that um that that these people basically had the, the uh civilized capacity as if you will, you know. And he said that and that's number five in the aims and objectives of uh of uh, uh, uh the uh UNIA. So I just wanted to add that to go to coincide with what um with what uh Ali was saying in regards to why he was saying that nothing could be done unless uh uh, uh something is done for the Negro, you know. So if if you believe these things, so if Mr. Garvey believed in these things, why is he spending the labor of his life, you know, trying to uh, uh, work in and on the behalf of the Negro if he, number one, believed that the, the tribes of Africa are backwards and savage? And like what Ali was saying is that nothing could be done for the Negro unless somebody does it for him, you know? So... This, these are two problematic statements that we just addressed so far. Indeed. Um, I want to just, I know Ali want to jump in as well, but I, I want to get into this Garvey flag thing. Um, let me see. Let me make sure I have the right one. Yeah, I was just looking for the um, piece that Grim was just talking about so we could show the people from the aims and objectives of the UNIA they can see for themselves. Some, some, some of our family already know. I'm sure they already know, you know, because we have smart people and you know that follow us, man, and very, you know, educated folks, studied people who already know a lot of this stuff, man. So, you know, they, they, I'm sure a lot of them already know that that you know exists inside of the aims and objectives of the UNIA. So, I'm just so, trying to find it for you know for no, those definitely. who don't. You know, go ahead, go ahead. That's right. No, you're right. I think people need to know that an emphasis needs to be placed upon that, that Garvey, like a lot of black immigrants who come over here from that time until now, look down upon black Americans. You know, it's, you know, they kind of came with the pull yourself up by, by your bootstrap mentality as well. And that was not good for our people and, and we're going to get into some of the other you know like i said immigrants that came over who were fully about our people you was going to say something ali yeah and that bootstrap thing if you think about it it's kind of crazy especially for colonized nations people coming from colonized nations third world countries or as donald trump would have would have said it's some shithole country right that still to this day is that right? It's some 
third world country, some <laughs> underdeveloped place coming here, telling us what we need to do to pull ourselves up. Meanwhile, their countries are poverty stricken, crime ridden and, and, and everything else, man. It just, it's just kind of weird that the you know people have the audacity to even do something like that. Indeed. Well, let me let, let me ask y'all a question real quick before I pull this up. For years, we've heard about the RBG flag, the red, the black, and the green flag during the protests of the brutal murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, among others, less uh, publicized, highly publicized, I should say, lynchings, public lynchings by today's race soldiers and, and their proxies that, that wear police uniforms as well. I've, I've seen numerous RBG flags. Juneteenth has been hijacked, right? The the red, white, and blue that represents America, the Americanism of Juneteenth has been hijacked by Garvey's colors of red, black, and green, which shows how pervasive Garveyisms have have become in the thoughts, as Ali has said earlier, and and, and Grim was speaking to as well. You know, he's kind of embedded in the psyche. It's like when people say we've been here for 400 years, it's just not true. We, we haven't been here. That's something Elijah Muhammad made up copying a biblical uh, passage about the Israelites being strangers in a foreign land for 400 years, especially at the time that he, he wrote that our people weren't here nowhere near 400 years at that point. So, you know, we just follow a lot of that stuff. Honest KS, for the contribution to, to the platform. So what what have y'all heard that the red, black, and green flag represented through the years? Well, well I heard that um, the red stood for the blood of the people. The black was representative of the people, the so-called black people and that the green represented the land. Now, that part was never clear. I guess the land of Africa is what the green, I'm assuming, is supposed to have represented. I, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm not sure of. But I, I know that, you know, what I've always heard was that the green represented the land. Assume, like Again, assuming they were talking about Africa. Mm-hmm. So we 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 have this reference and brother, we got this from brother Ty Harper as well, because he speaks on this a lot. And it's actually something that I've heard a, a, a while ago. But you mm -hmm. know, some things you forget, right? Because you haven't heard it in so long. So let, let's pull this up. Let's let's share this. Let me blow this up some so people could see it. So it says, uh, in in little more than two years between Garvey's arrival in the United States on March 24th, 1916, and July 2nd, 1918, the UNIA had been incorporated by the state of New York. His perception of race relations in the United States was shaped by his formative Caribbean experience. While Garvey would enter a new quote-unquote political phase, as Hill puts it, after July 1921, during the period 1918 through 1921, Garvey's propaganda demonstrated an immense sympathy with the Black American left and the labor movement. In 1920, he claimed that the color red in the UNIA flag showed their sympathy with the reds of the world. And the green, now let's peep this family, peep this, and the green for the Irish in their fight for freedom. So the red and the green in Garvey's red, black, and green flag represents the reds of the world, not the blood of the Negro coursing through the veins of black bodies. Uh, the green doesn't, according to Garvey, represent the, the land of Africa as 
Many have, have proposed. So that was footnote 162, and it's highlighted where this particular source comes from. So let's blow that up as much as we can. Marcus Garvey to White, August 18th. So I'm guessing this was a letter. Nine, I'm guessing this is 1920. In Hill, um, this citation throws me at the moment. So I, I believe that might be chapter two, maybe verse 19 on page 603, if I'm reading that correctly. So everybody else can go and pull the source up as well to show that Garvey's red, black, and green flag represents black people, it represents Irish folks, and it represents the reds of the world whom Garvey felt was being oppressed by the white man in the world. The idea of Garvey's flag came from this man right here, whose flag was yellow, black, and red. Yellow for the yellows of the world, Br yellow, brown, and black, excuse me, brown for the brown people of the world, and black for the black people of the world. This man's name is Hubert Harrison. So um, I don't know if I want to go into Hubert Harrison just yet, well, let me right. show them. Yeah, all right. Let Go me ahead, show ahead. them real quick the piece that Grim was talking about so they could see it. Mm -hmm. I have it highlighted here. You see, yep. the declared objects of the association are to establish a universal confraternity among the race to promote the spirit of pride and love, to reclaim the fallen, to administer to and assist the needy, to assist in civilizing the backward tribes of Africa to assist in the development of independent Negro nations and communities, et cetera. So just so you see that. That's right. Uh, that, to that's assist there. in civilizing the backwards tribes of Africa. You see, you can't, to, in my opinion, you cannot have the love for your people. I heard this old story about Garvey as well. I, I haven't been able to confirm it. Where Garvey says something to the effect of he wouldn't give a bum or a homeless person money on the streets because he feel that they should be able to rise above their conditions and do for themselves. I, I can't confirm this, but I heard that a, a few years ago. So we could, if and if that quote is true, then it aligns with what Garvey felt about our people. Going back to the first article that Ali pulled up, where he says the Negro, the, the fact is that the modern Negro is a lazy, good-for-nothing slumberer. So here in America, the modern Negro is a lazy, good-for-nothing slumberer, and in Africa, they're backwards savages. That doesn't sound like, you know, one of, one of some, a champion for our people. Just real quick, Arthur Ward said, Hubert Harrison is one of my favorite black atheists. I thought you was going to say one of my favorite black socialists, Brother Arthur Ward, but I'm going to let that atheist one slide for now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to say, too, about the about what, what you all read about the uh, the red, black, and green flag. And I mean, all of this stuff is researchable. It, it's not secret. It's not uh, arcane. The bottom line is that when particularly with the uh, Irish and the, the Irish uh, revolutionaries had a great effect or great influence on Marcus Garvey. And if you look up the uh, those Irish uprisings that took place in uh, 1916 and the things that was going on with the Irish rebellion, you know, Garvey was a, a, uh, an admirer. I can't think of all of the, the people names right now, the different uh, Irishmen, but Garvey was, um, and, and maybe some of that stuff I think that we probably dropped in the inbox, but uh, Garvey was highly influenced by the, by the Irish uh, movement and the things that they had done. Around, as a matter of fact, that terminology that they use, um, that uh, Garvey was using Africa, uh, for the Africans at home and abroad was actually taken from the Irish movement that uh, 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 Ireland for the Irish at home and, and abroad. 
And I mean, all of this stuff Ooh, is research. That's right. That's right. Yeah, bro. All of this stuff is researchable. So, you know, as, as a matter of fact, the one of the uh, Irish leaders uh, was supposed to, these were meetings that were set up between the leader of the Irish and Marcus Garvey that was supposed to take place. But uh, I guess something had happened that the meeting never take took place. Um, but but Garvey was supposed to actually meet with the Irish leader, so he was highly in, uh, influenced by the things that the Irish was doing. So that goes to back up the fact that that green and that red, black, and green flag does not represent some land. I think somebody probably came up later and reinterpreted that flag, but that flag is just the original intentions of it was just basically what we said it was particularly that green in the in the red black and green flag was it for being in solidarity uh with uh the the irish uh movements and Which uh is... yeah i mean it's it's i mean it's just plain as day just research that stuff. somebody so, said that's a, that was a robert reed said red black and green sounds like a people of color movement and you wonder why black America has been stunted for a hundred years. He then said what we concluded. This is the beginnings of all the hell blacks are facing now. Woo! Trying to reverse this thinking. Woo! That's Woo! right. That, that's, and hey, and, man, we can just cut the show off now, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Come uh, on. You know? Because we yeah. can't man, just the other the show, day. Man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now be, right. he's 100 right and now let me show you how crazy that was for him to even think that we should be in alignment with irish people right we know that irish people were not only um not only used as overseers during the slave era but they also owned slaves these people became classified as white folks. And during the draft riots in New York, Irish people were attacking black people because white, because they were classified as white at the time of the Civil War, the union needed more men to fight in the military. So this is before they, uh, they started to enlist the black soldiers or the colored troops they started to try to draft white Irishmen from New York. And the Irish did not want to fight in the Civil War on behalf of the Union. That's right. Against the, the Southern Confederates over the issue of slavery. So you know what the Irish did? They, because they wouldn't allow blacks to fight in the military and they started drafting the irish the irish in new york started to attack black people go look up the draft rights of 1863. that's right talk to him ali and, and we can go back further to that into the colonial period when Ooh. uh I, I can't remember but ali just reminded me of it man mm. and we we haven't addressed it if you go back to the colonial period that that games of new york era because Ali, you was reading it one day when we was uh we were studying and they was talking about how they brought the black kids out into the ran them out into the street, burned their houses mm -hmm. and stumped the black kids' faces into the street. Yeah. You you remember that, brother? Yeah. Well, basically that yeah. that's also reflected in that movie, The Gangs of New York, when they was taking all of the uh the freemen out their houses, and this is way before uh, 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 the Civil War, you know, this is during the, uh, the colonial period. Yes. Yeah, that's right. In colonial New York. Yeah, there, a lot of people don't know that New York's history with slavery of in, uh, the enslavement of Africans and a lot of the racial conflicts that happened in New York is deep. It's deep. A lot of shit happened before the United States even became a thing right in New York, right in New York City and downtown and lower Manhattan. A lot of shit and it happened. Was, it was Irishmen that, that attacked those uh, uh, black New Yorkers at that day and time. That's a fact. That's an actual, that's an absolute fact. You know, um, they even, uh, there was a, uh, on Fifth Avenue, there was an, uh, an orphan 
an orphanage for black children. These people came to set that orphanage on fire, trying That's to right. kill them, those kids in there. You know this, but but I'm just saying this just goes to speak to people coming from other places that don't really know our plight, but then try to come in and become the leaders of movements, try to then start redirecting our people into going into different ways where they don't need to be going. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're ignorant to who we are and what it is that we've come through in this country. And, and I, I believe Garvey suffered that same ignorance. Honestly, there was absolutely no reason for black Americans to be in allegiance with Irish people. We were not only, not only did they attack our people, but they also used to clash with our people over employment issues. That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> you know, as, let, let me pull this one comment up. Let me, you know, we, we got some detractors in the house because this is what happens when you start to uh, ro ro slow rotisserie and cook these sacred cows, right? So this guy, Kari P, says, look, because you are approaching a critique of Garvey from a fake ADOS angle, you are missing the context, but carry on, bros. First and foremost, we're not approaching anything from any ADOS angle because we're not ADOS and we don't rock with that organization or that group or that name. We are freedmen and the descendants of freedmen. And the history is clear about Garvey's dealings. We are citing Garvey's own words. Context right. can be skewed in many different ways according to how a person chooses to stretch the truth, right. lie, or simply stand upon the historical records. What we're doing here today is standing upon the historical records and then giving our opinion of what we think about that. Because how do you align with the Irish? When the Irish, you are you skipping past the Irish in America to talk about Irish freedom fighters over in I Ireland? Because no Can't intellectual would, would seek to do that. They would say, well, right. the Irish here are trying to be a part of the white race because they were not initially included as being a part of the white race at all in the United States of America, just like the Italians were. And yet, these were the people that were attacking us. Garvey made some questionable statements when it came to our people that we just read. And we're going to get a little bit deeper into this topic. So where, where are we going next with this, brothers? Let, let's go with the... Uh... And, and I'm glad the, the brother is saying that because that Me means, because you know, whenever somebody says something, then y'all know that we got to go a little bit deeper. Let's go to the, the Jim Crow statements, the pro Jim Crow statements that he said about our people, you know, that this being a white country and that the white man, you know, uh, should, uh, you know, want to be separate and want, don't want Negroes around them or something like that on the Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, we yeah. covered so much. Let, if we can, let's pull up some of those statements and, and go into that, you know, because okay. that also ties into the other two guys that, you know, we basically call the try, like that brother Reed was saying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of that stuff is the beginning of problems because uh, Marcus Garvey and, his, and, and a lot of the problematic things he did which I don't think that he was necessarily a, 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 a evil, evil person, but in something that he shouldn't have been in. But he, his ideologies gave birth to the, uh, some of the, the things that Noble Drew Ali said that once again was mission drift, which evolved to the things that Elijah Muhammad said, which was which uh, free, which was a uh, mission drift from the uh, positions that the freedmen should have been taken. And like that brother so eloquently said, that's why we freaking 100 years behind. Because a, right. a lot of our people in some shape, form, or fashion adopted a lot of this bootstrapperism and uh, all of these different things from uh, uh, all three of these men or each or each of them individually. Right. And and and. and one of the important points, um, Brother Kari, 
with, with brother Kari P, you got to think about this. Um, one of the things that Garvey brought that is not um, a part of our psyche, it wasn't a part of our psyche, it wasn't a part of our character, is the idea that we should flee our country. That's not that's not who we are by and large. Now you have people, and I know you're gonna say, oh, well, there's people who left the South and went to the North, or there were people who left uh, the United States and went to Canada, right? Trying to free, flee racial terrorism and oppression and, 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 and slavery. But the large majority of us stayed here. The large majority of us didn't go to Liberia. The large majority of us did not go to Sierra Leone. You see what I'm saying? The large majority of us didn't go to Nova Scotia. The large majority of us did not go to the Caribbean. The, the, the large majority of us stayed here. And even our movement within the United States is still within the country. And, it only, the, and the only reason that it was done was for the purpose of upward mobility and to, and to try to move away from the racial terrorism and the theft and, and, and the destruction of the, the Europeans in the South so that they could try to position themselves in a way to economically move forward and to politically move forward, right? And so the enlightenment was happening in the North. The opportunities was in the North. It was in Philadelphia, it was in Detroit, right? Motown, Motor Town, Mo the Motor City, Detroit, Chicago. You, you understand what I'm saying? New York City with the Harlem Renaissance. So the, the people who were having their land stolen from them in the South, some of them had no choice but to move to move north and to try to become more progressive, right? So that's what that was. We didn't flee the country. This thing about leaving, going to Africa, that's something that wasn't really native to us. Even when the whole Liberian project came up, most of our people was against that. They didn't want, they didn't want to do that. They didn't me, want to do that. Go ahead, go me, ahead brother. Me, we got brother logic on, but you brought up mm -hmm. Africa, so I think this is a good time to segue. Another man that came from the islands, a, a brother that I deeply, deeply respect, Hubert Harrison. If somebody is coming from the Caribbean and they ask me, what can I do to help and how can I help? I'll, <laughs> I'll give them this book first so you can see what a true ally, right, in the, in the racial sense of, of the a connection means this man that understood that you got to separate race from class. You have to. So, and, and, and this guy went at Du Bois, the, the, the talented, talented 10th. I would like and, to respond to Doc Phyllis comment to his question and comment when you finish. Right. Okay, cool. So let me yo, read this real quick. Yo, right? Abbott. Bef ahead, before bro. you get to before you get to Hubert Harrison, let me just just say something real quick. So, like the problem, I don't know what all y'all covered tonight, right? But we have to understand and 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 really look into these people that we have heralded as heroes and understand what happened historically with our people. See, once you demand specificity as a lineage and as a political uh, framework, you have to start understanding how you got from being specific in the first place because there was a specific movement happening Talk right him. after the Civil War. Talk to you him. understand? The freedmen knew what needed to be done. Graham, do you still got those stats for all those uh, statesmen the freedmen made right after the Civil War? Uh, and, and we knew what needed to be done. Frederick Douglass knew what needed to be done. Robert Smalls, Hiram Rebels, like all these different states, they knew what needed to be done. And then we didn't just immediately flee from the South and That's go right. north. That's no. right. When, when, civil, when the Civil War ended, most of us stayed in the South. In fact, the majority of our people still live in the South right now. Do you understand? And so even when the migration happened and we were forced from the South and we had to escape domestic terrorism and state oppression, Right. Those are still our states of origin. That's where we come from. And in those states, the people that we were developing were mission focused. 
you get the these foreigners, right? And they're, they're, they're that's not a derogatory statement. They're not connected to the Freedman story and the Freedman history. That's right. They come from colon, col colonialism in the Caribbean or in Africa or wherever it may be, right? They don't come from what we come from. And what their idea, right? They was able to mesmerize our people and get large followings. Great. But their idea of what needed to be done was totally different from what grassroots foundational black Americans were doing. We were doing civil rights justice work here in America. That's we right. wrote the book on civil rights. Every major civil rights movement was Freeman inspired and, 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 and led. You understand? Every, every All, civil rights movement around the world was influenced by the Freedmen. That's right. Yes, but it's, it's specifically the 1866 Civil Rights Act. The 1864, 65, I mean, the 1964, the 1965, uh, and the 1968 Civil Rights Act, right? We the ones who created the 14th Amendment was about the, was, if it wasn't for the freedmen, you wouldn't have no 14th Amendment. There would be nothing, no, there would be no constitutional language talking about birthright citizenship that all these other immigrants come and they hook in and have anchor babies with. There wouldn't even be none of that. There wouldn't be no 15th Amendment. You understand? There wouldn't be a 13th Amendment. Although that's, uh, we got to do a breakdown on, on what the 13th Amendment really is, right? And it's legislative. Oh, yeah, definitely. Understand. Right? And so what we got to understand is we have got, we have deviated from the Freedman path that, that was set up by Freedman statesmen who were fighting, bleeding, dying, and killing to get liberty, justice, and the American uh, way of life here in this country that our ancestors built. And so you have these, 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 these people who are not tied into that. And what they're trying to do is not further that plight, but they have their plight is totally different. They want to take us to where they come from and, and do what we've done here, there, and create an America in Jamaica or create America in Ghana or create a, They say if they can do it for these white folks, they can do it for us. So that's what they trying to do. Those Marcus Garvey ushered in mission drift in a way that we hadn't seen until he had come. That's right. Ultimate mission drift. The Freedman was about getting our fair share of America free. And so nobody really got back on track until Martin Luther King. Martin that's Luther right. King came back and got us back on track doing civil rights justice. Work. And what, wait, and, and what happened? You know if you're on track or not. And what happened, right? The, he got attacked by other people who were connected to Garvey's mission drift. Woo! Yes. Facts. Woo! So we got I know I don't like it tonight, but it's the truth now. It's the truth. Hey, 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 hey. It's the truth. You know, sometimes you 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 gotta take a take your scoldings and, and take your truth. It is what it is. So I want y'all to go in. I want y'all to go in tonight. But I want to read this real quick, and then I, I, I want. I think Ali wanted to address somebody. Nah, yeah, he, he is. He is. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read this. He can address the comment, and then we can get into what Ali has pulled up the Garvey Must Go campaign. So he could he could lead right into that. By the 1920 convention, now this is talking about Hubert Harrison. It says by the 1920 convention, however, a campaign was underway to have Harrison dismissed from the editorship of the paper. For those that don't know, this man, Hubert Harrison, made Garvey's The Negro World newspaper the intellectual force for blacks back in those days, what it was. Harrison, in turn, was highly critical of Garvey and worked against him. His criticisms concerned the extravagance of Garvey's claims, his ego, the conduct, of his stock selling schemes and his political practices. Though Harrison continued to write columns and book reviews for the Negro world into 1922, their political differences grew and he sought to develop political alternatives to Garvey. Because you know, when people get egotistical, you gotta find a way to divorce yourselves from those type of people. But anyway, in particular, Harrison urged political action in terms of electoral politics, attempted to build an all black liberty party to run African American candidates for political. Now, this man is from the islands. Let me let me start that over. In particular, 
Harrison urged political action in terms of electoral politics. These are the things that Garvey wasn't doing. Attempted to build an all-black liberty party to run African-American candidates for political offices, including the presidency. Consistently maintained the position that African-Americans' principal struggle was in the United States and that they should therefore not seek to develop a state in Africa opposed imperialism and did not seek an African empire, argued that Africans, not African Americans, would lead struggles in Africa, vociferously opposed the Ku Klux Klan, who Garvey met with, and we're going to get into that as well, and favored reason, science, and fact-based knowledge over emotional appeals and exaggerated claims to the masses, i.e. cult leaderisms. So, right. That's that's for and, and to, to, to yeah, brother brother mm -hmm. Carrie, it's not it wasn't just see the crazy thing about your comment, you saying it was other uh Caribbeans that that had uh complaints about or criti criticisms about Garvey, but it wasn't just them. You there was a whole campaign with A. Philip Randolph and and and, and a, a couple of other guys, man, that where African Americans had some problems with what he was saying and doing, you understand? It wasn't just it wasn't just uh, Caribbean immigrants that had problems with what he was doing. And to the uh, the other brother, I forget his name, Doc something. Was this his name? I wanted to answer because he said, "What are we going to do?" But actually, Logic kind of answered it already when he talked about what it was we were already That's doing. Right. So That's he's right. saying, what are you going to do? No, what have we already been doing? See, that's, that's right. the thing. It's not even about, he said that um, we've, our usefulness to this empire is, is, it doesn't exist anymore. The fact of the matter is that's not true. That's not true. We are a big part of this economy. They depend on us. Well, we, well, we, we saved this but, country but, over and over again. It, it, we saved you this country. Oh, oh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yo, yeah. Not only that, right? He says our value is like not there anymore. It doesn't exist. Not only that, right? He said that uh, what what he doesn't understand is when he asked, "What are we going to do?" And you told him what we always been doing. But what is that? That's civil rights justice work. You understand? We are the best at civil rights justice work. That's all you got to do. Do what your ancestors did. What did they do? Civil rights justice work. When you, when you, when I don't know how y'all get into a, a mindset where we don't know what we need to do. Uh, let me help you out. Whenever you're stuck, not knowing what to do, think about Fannie Lou Hamer and do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. Facts. You understand? Facts. Whenever you get stuck and you don't know what to do, how about you? Turn on Be the Power, and we're giving out divine instructions Fact. weekly on what you need to do. But if you, if, but when it's all said and done, it wraps around I, until we get our fair share in this country, we are to continuously, perpetually, generationally be doing civil rights justice work in this country because the, the history proves that we are the very best and most successful at it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, we man. know about the we know about Richard B. Moore and a lot of those guys you're talking about, the 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 name Negro and his evil use. We 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 know we know about that. Um, but but here's the thing, right? Just to the point, you have other, you know, to to the brother's point, you had other Caribbeans. One of them as well, particularly those of it's a, it was a group that was working inside the UNIA called the African Blood Brotherhood with with people like uh, Claude, Claude McKay, right, who was also of the Caribbean. Um, another man by the name of um, Cyril Briggs, who was also of the Caribbean, right, and they also, even though they were working within the UNIA at a certain point, they also had a, ultimately wound up having a problem with Garvey as well based on some of Garvey's problematic statements, right? See, we're not making this stuff up. And it's no, not, and, and, right. to, and to, to Kari's other point, initially he was saying it was an ADOS thing, but that's now right. he's acknowledging that 
other Caribbean people also had a problem with this man and, and, and found a lot of the stuff he was saying That's and right. doing problematic That's as well. Right. So the brothers of the African blood brotherhood, the ones I just mentioned, they wound up having a problem with him as well because of his meeting and affiliation with the Ku Klux Klan in 1921. You understand those statements that he made with them, um, you know, about black people and, and his relationship with them and stuff. So they wind up having a problem with him as well, right? That's the right. failure of his Black Star Line company and looking to the Ku Klux Klan to help finance the Black Star Line and get it back going. No, so a lot of these people have problems and it wasn't just Caribbean people. So that, you know, that's, that's just not the truth, you know, and we're not looking at it from no one single perspective. We're just dealing with the truth of what this man was saying and doing and how it was problematic, not just for African Americans, so but on. also let me, let me, Caribbeans let me that were here too. But Logic, before you go in, let me pull this up. The brother Joel Armstrong has been having a problem with everything that we read. So he wants us to retract stuff until he can find it. You should already know everything about Marcus Garvey because it seems like you have a deep reverence for this man. So you obviously didn't do good enough research prior to tonight's live stream or else you would know what the critiques and criticisms of Marcus Garvey was. You would know his own words. We're giving references. We're not retracting anything. That sounds absolutely crazy. <laughs> well, no, listen. Well, the, one, let me, ahead, let, me let me just throw this in there real quick, Ali, and I'll give, give it right back to you. So this really speaks. I'm glad we got to keep echoing the, where the disconnect lies at while we go through this tonight so it's not lost, right? How does Marcus Garvey think that, like, what? Like, see, a Freeman wouldn't make this mistake, right? Why would you think that? It's a clever idea to cozy up to the Ku Klux Klan, right? Knowing their history in America and how our people been battling groups Come like on. the Ku Klux exactly. Klan and and the, uh, the the Bushwhackers and the Midnight Marauders and the Red Shirts and the Rifleman Club. Like we actually have the white, white, white League. That's right. Wars fighting these people. Blood has been shed. And you think it's a good idea. See, that's a man who's disconnected from that. He doesn't have any ancestors that was hung by the Ku Klux Klan or else he wouldn't have his ass up there doing business with him. <laughs> he didn't have any uncles and cousins and aunts and grandmothers that was raped by Ku Klux Klan members and groups of the like. That's how you get there. There's a disconnect. So when you come from somewhere else, you do shit like say hmm let me work with the irish who ain't never been our friends in america right and show them reverence there must be the way let me partner with them no let's partner with the ku klux klan who have who his whole entire outfit is stained with our ancestors blood there is a disconnect that's how you know that's not one of us anybody did, who was did we pull up the pro jim crow statements yet no, not well, yet. You muted Ali. So my, my bad. Yeah, go ahead. You, I, now. Ali, you want to pull this screen up? Um, which one? I don't even know what I have up. What what I have? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Garvey this, must go campaign. Wait, hold on, hold on. Grim, is yeah, this yeah. the one you're talking about with the pro Jim Crow statements? This one has something in it. Okay, it definitely okay. has something in it. Okay, um, let's go. Let's go. Wait, hold on to Marcus Gracie. You might have to go back to the beginning. You're spamming right now. All we do is sources. We're pulling up sources. We're pulling yeah. up quotations with the citations that they're derived from. Chill, fam. Pay attention or just wait till the stream is over and go back and watch it from the beginning. But all we're doing is sources. Go ahead, brother Ali. All right. So this here, just uh, let me let me move it back so he can see what where this is coming from. This is an article about the Garvey Must Go campaign that was done in PBS, for PBS, right? Public Broadcasting System, service, whatever. I'm just gonna read a part of it, right? About this Garvey Must Go campaign that wind up um, taking effect and uh, ultimately, I guess, helped to lead to his deportation. When Marcus Garvey first arrived in the United States in 1916, he quickly found his way to many of New York's most prominent black radical activists and intellectuals. And at least briefly, Garvey enjoyed their support. 
But by 1920, A. Philip Randolph and other black leaders, some of whom had supported Garvey after his arrival in the United States, came to believe that Garvey's program for black advancement was unsound and that Garvey himself was a charlatan. Though they admired his skill as a propagandist, these prominent black critics derided Garvey's proposed solutions for the problems of African-Americans. They believed that his plans for black progress, including the Black Star Line and the establishment of a Pan-African empire, were unrealistic and ill-advised. They considered the Universal Negro Improvement Association's grandiose titles and military regalia to be preposterous. And they thought Garvey, with his assumption of a regal uh, posture under the title Provisional President of Africa, to be little more than a self-aggrandizing buffoon. A. Philip Randolph, who had introduced Garvey to his first American audience, on a Harlem street corner said Garvey has succeeded in making the Negro the laughing stock of the world. The federal investigations into the finances of Black Star Line, along with a blistering analysis of the shipping line by W.E.B. Du Bois in the NAACP's Crisis Magazine gave fuel to Garvey's Black critics. Randolph personally critiqued the e economic feasibility of the Black Star Line in The Messenger, an influential magazine he co-edited with Chandler Owen and accused Garvey of squandering the hard-earned money of his hardworking poor supporters. Black opposition to Garvey coalesced into what came to be known as the Garvey Must Go campaign. Supporters of the campaign, known collectively as the Friends of Negro Freedom, intended to unmask Garvey as a fraud before his Black supporters. They also appealed to the federal government to step up investigations of irregularities in the Black Star Line and to look into alleged acts of violence on the part of Garvey's inner circle. The Garvey Must Go campaign gained momentum after Garvey held a secret meeting with Edward Young Clark, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan in June of 1922. Immediately afterward, Randall and Owens' uh, Messenger magazine published an article entitled Marcus Garvey, the Black Imperial Wizard becomes messenger boy of the white Ku Klux Klegel. Black leaders were further infuriated when they learned that Garvey at a speaking engagement in New Orleans remarked that because black people had not built the railroad system, they should not insist on riding in That's the same right. cars with white That's patrons. That we got That's the it. quotes too. We found the quotes to all of that stuff. Right. The actual quotes. So let me uh let let me just read this paragraph and then I'll stop. The messenger vowed to begin a rigorous editorial campaign against Garvey and promised to fire the opening gun in a campaign to drive Garvey and Garveyism and all his sinister viciousness from the American soil. The campaign from this point was uh, this point on was characterized by vitriolic personal attacks on both sides and by escalating threats of violence. Garvey must go meetings were violently dispersed by Garvey's followers. A Philip Randolph it's like received, they're doing in the chat. My bad. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. We ain't we ain't going nowhere. Ain't nobody we running ain't going us nowhere. That's a fact. Uh, a Philip Randolph received the seventh hand of a white man in the mail. It was you, you see, <laughs> it was accompanied by a note signed by the KKK. But Randolph believed the hand had been sent by the UNIA. I'm gonna stop sharing that. Because I'm going to I'm going to find too, and y'all could go in from there if y'all want to talk about that a little. I'm going to find the actual news article where that was I, at I, and the, the quote that he made. Go ahead, April. I, I just want to say that the, what, the, the most interesting thing about that, right, and how it compares to what is continuously going on, and obviously it was kind of like what's launched this whole type of uh, thing to happen here, right? And, and what I'm talking about is in that article, you, you you talked about how Philip Randolph introduced Garvey to his first American audience, Freeman yep. audience, yes? Right? Yep. And so instead of Garvey, right, he meets A. Philip Randolph, who's all who's already engaged in free, Freeman justice work, right? We already got an agenda. We, we, we've been here. We know what we're supposed to do. Here comes a man who ain't been here but a couple months, and now he's taking over the movement. Look at that. Taking over the Freeman. What kind of arrogance and disrespect is that to the Freeman? And see, they continuously do us like that. That's why they come here now and, and, and feel comfortable talking about our reparations, talking about everything that like, ain't got nothing to do with them. That's the same thing Garvey did when he came over here. And just instead yeah. of joining the brothers and the Freeman said, how can I help y'all brothers? How can I assist? And how can I get behind you brothers? No. 
y'all get out the way. Y'all don't y'all don't know what y'all need to do for yourselves. I know what needs to be done. That is ultimately disrespectful. And what and the, the, the get out, get Garvey out campaign needs needs to not, it, it was it was it was needed then. And, and it's, it's needed, needed now. now. Talk to him. The only difference is instead of getting Garvey out of the uh, country, you need to get him out of your mind. His <laughs> philosophies right. and opinions have been <laughs> crippling to the Freedman justice plight. That's and and let, let me say something, because somebody yeah, brought up something in the chat, and I brought up the triad, and I call him the triad, Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey brought, uh, gave birth to Drew Ali, uh, so to speak, Drew Ali gave birth to Elijah Muhammad, and we talk about the three sources of mission drift, because those men, are, those three men are chiefly responsible for basically uh, a philosophy that a lot of our people hold on to um, in regards to uh, 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 the 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 mission of the freedmen, you know, and this you know a lot of bootstrapperism. Uh, I mean, a whole lot of different things. We talk about them all the time, brothers. But I just want to talk about the the triad in because we talking about. The fact that Marcus Garvey um, met with the Ku Klux Klan, right? <clears throat> and the triad, everybody in the triad of, of Garvey, Drew Ali, and Elijah Muhammad all had some shape, form, or fashion of some type of relationship with the Ku Klux Klan. Y'all just read the Garvey Must Go campaign, which a lot of the freedmen uh, leaders of our leaders at that time was upset with Garvey because he was uh uh he met with the Klan and was leading in that direction. So we also have a statement by Noble Drew Ali that was basically pro Klan. And uh uh Naheem probably can quote it word for word, but Noble Drew Ali said, When I go to the South, I'm gonna meet the Ku Klux Klan, but what he said, but everybody what he said, but they're gonna take me to where I need to go. It, the oral saying says that um, I am going, I am doing the South. When I get there, it is going to appear as if the Klan is going to stop me. Then they are going to lead me where I am going. Right. So here you got a pro uh, Ku Klux Klan statement from Garvey meeting, uh, Garvey meeting them. We got Noble Drew Ali with the pro-Klan statement, and we already discussed on previous shows, Noble Drew Ali's um, uh, pro-Jim uh, Crow, pro-Confederate statements, and then we also have the philosophy uh, and the teachings of Elijah Muhammad that are in court with Garvey as far as separation and, and uh, anti-Americanism and, uh, 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 and also with them you know, via Malcolm X, I'm not, you know, but I'm sure it was sanctioned by Elijah Muhammad, or I, or I should just say the Nation of Islam, also met with the Ku Klux Klan. So, Facts. you know, we got the triad, and what they all got in common, they all got in common that in some shape, form, or fashion, they were either pro-Jim Crow or uh, esoterically, or they had met with the Klan. Hey yo. And and see, like he's I think the brother said how hold on, let me read his comment. How it's can you argue? Yeah, it's a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. He said, How can you argue Garvey's Caribbeanness to be a weakness while championing <laughs> while championing Harrison, the Caribbean immigrant? Well, that that's a false statement. Like that's nobody right. was arguing his Caribbeanness as his that's weakness. Right. What we're talking about and, is and him nobody being championed, nobody championed who Hubert Harrison. The only champions are the freedmen. That's Hubert Harrison right. was Abba what said is, that is an ally. That's, that's right. Ally. He pointed out he was pointing he out no that he was an ally and knew how to play his position. That's, That's right. what he was saying. Yeah. It didn't say anything about him being a Caribbean. He said that this particular Caribbean knew how to That's play his right. position when the They're other Caribbean listening. did not. <laughs> uh, here, here's one. Here, let's, let's, let's address this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen that one. Baruti Katimbo says BTP oh, wow. seems xenophobic 
against blacks so, from other countries. <laughs> what you said, logic. So there so, are let lots me of. Up, man. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me read it. Let me read it, Grim. There are lots of African Americans that support Garvey. So again, on balance, you should have a scholarly African American who supports Garveyism. We don't mind having anybody up here that supports Garveyism, scholarly or or, or not. You're not going to get around the right. facts that are being presented here tonight and that a lot of what Garvey said leaned pro-Confederate. He met with the Klan. Hold on. Go, go ahead, go ahead. I'm saying, like, she's saying that we need to have somebody like that on this program right now? That's what she's yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. He or right. she. But what difference Why? does it That's make? Not, that, yes, <laughs> it doesn't that even make no not, difference. Yeah, and, and it does, not only does it not make a difference, but it's not... Nobody like that's a part of tonight's program. You don't come into class and tell the teacher you should have such and such in here teaching with you. That ain't how nothing works. If you don't like this education, if you it's too potent for you to handle it, go to another channel. We are given nothing but the facts every night, all night, whenever BTP is on live. Man, you ain't, can't ain't, the ain't nobody, ain't nobody no xenophobe, man. Man, no, but listen, no, but, but no. Man, listen. They they want to use that as mm -hmm. as a as a card that they can play. Let yeah, me tell you about I, I, I realize that. I, I I recognize that. But man, look, the bottom line ain't nobody no Zeno fool. I but am. The Logic line, is. But, but, <laughs> hold on, hold on. But the but the bottom line is that the the facts are basically being pointed out in regard to these things, be because. Garvey, number one, didn't understand our relationship with the Irish from 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 the Obvious. from before the slave trade through the slave uh uh, uh antebellum slave period <laughs> all the way you know to to his time he didn't understand that he just knew he admired those people and those mission and their mission that they had going on in their land he didn't understand our relationships with the Ku Klux Klan. So, I mean, we can't go over there. But let me say this, man, about this, this uh, universal blackness, man. That's right. I get it. I get it. And we know that there is an aspect of the mission where universal blackness does and can come into play. We're not saying that that, that is, is not the case. But what we're saying is that this particular Caribbean man was out of order and out of place and he was dealing in the affairs that he had no business dealing with as far as leading the freedmen away from the mission. The mission was set. The mission was already set by our father, Frederick Douglass. You follow what I'm saying? The That's father right. of the nation. You know, we just had to keep moving on and pressing into that direction. But yet you had a contingency of people who spent their hard earned money or the man who bought some raggy ships that wasn't even seaworthy to make a trip to Africa. That's right. We we talking about a man who kept saying back to Africa, back to Africa, whose ships uh, uh, failed. You understand what I'm saying? Whose ships failed. Who basically, well, we can get into this if y'all want, brothers. He basically was uh, convicted of the crime. And he was exiled from the country. From the country, you could say he was set up and things of that nature. That's and he was right. guilty, but right. But basically, he was sent to Jamaica, right? Come on, exiled to Jamaica. That's right. Lived in Jamaica, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> then he 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 had all financial ties. He took his wife, the rest of his wife's savings and inheritance, and then squandered that in Jamaica, right? And after that, in all of his ventures in Jamaica being unsuccessful, this man then got on a boat and then went and moved to England. And then he started getting mixed up in the affairs of the English. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and lived the rest of his life in England, getting mixed up in the affairs of the uh, of the black English. And then on top of that, 
we talk about a man, and listen to this. We talk about a man who could have, but never ever set foot in Africa after teaching a back to Africa. <laughs> Bro, I would let me, I would ask the brother <laughs> Carry, the brother Kari, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Why didn't Garvey go to <laughs> Liberia? Why wasn't why did Garvey never go to Liberia? I know why he didn't go to Liberia, but I would like for Carrie to tell me why Garvey never went to Liberia. And we could send a link in, if y'all want. We could in, in one of one of his fiercest, <laughs> and I just want to continue and say one of his fiercest critics, W. E. B. Du Bois, he even went. After a while, and, and uh, moved and lived in North Africa. That's right. And he was a critic of Garvey. That's right. And and he moved to Africa and lived in Africa. But we had the greatest proponents of this uh, Pan Africanism, back to Africa ideology, and he never stepped foot on the continent. Not nope. one. Not a toe in the water. Nope. <laughs> you, the, 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 the triad that Grimm talked about. They, they all had that in common. And what they all had is a major hand in aggregating blackness, right? We were specific after the Civil War. We were the freemen. We knew who we was. Then they come with this, we the lost tribe of Shabazz nonsense. Everybody's Moroccan and Moorish, or Moorish <laughs> American. See, getting further and further off the path. Garvey, everybody's an African. Africa for the Africans. We when we 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 stopped being Africans a long time ago. We freedmen. <laughs> when, they, we hey, people, when they hey, when they kicked when they kicked our ancestors off that continent, that's when yeah. we stopped being that shit. And we knew it, and we knew it. We knew who he was, and we were doing all <laughs> kind of miraculous work. They called in seven years. Hold up, if we read one stat, they said that in. One year of the freedmen being emancipated, we had made a hundred years of progress, right? And one, once these other foreign uh, influencers come and these foreign ideas from people from not rooted in our work come here, we get further and further away from the mission, further and further away from liberty, further and further away from justice, right? Further and further away from who we are as a people in America, as Americans. They took us off of that. And we and took us out to lunch, man. This is coming from uh, the book uh, Mercer Baradaran's the, the Color of Money. It it says um they set up charities to take care of the poor and sick and to educate each other. Quote, we have progressed a century in a year, said one freedman. So, you know, just to you know, add some some sources to what Brother Logic is saying. Brother Josh just jumped in. Brother Josh, what, what are your thoughts on tonight's topic? Uh, man, you know, we, we've been talking about this one for a while. So to to uh, do the broadcast, it's good to see y'all on here. It's, it's good to have the conversation. And uh, I think you said, uh, uh, it was you, uh, Ali, I can't remember who said, the, made the point of, you know, that when he said the triad, if you notice one thing that, uh, that they had in common is that there seemed to be some type of cozying up to uh, the Ku Klux Klan or, or, you know, and I see that in the same way Logic said that we need to get that out of our minds. We need to get like that, that type of thinking out of our minds. Yeah, it's because what we see is eventually it's going to lead towards some type of affection and affinity to, uh, I don't know, it's weird how this works out, right? To the neo-Confederates. Because that's what I what I see people, a lot of people in the Moorish movement, they have some type of, because of, that's, the, that's the viewpoint that Drew Ali held, uh, was a, he, you know, blaming mm -hmm. us for things that, uh, blaming us for, for the position that we're in. Like, we, we did everything to put ourselves in that position. You hear some of the statements that Garvey held, it seemed like, I mean, he might have had some viewpoints that he shared with the Ku Klux Klan from, you know, from what he was saying. Um, so I see that we did a program, I don't know if it was last year or several months ago, called uh, uh, White Supremacy Creeping into Conscious Black Spaces, something like that. 
And I, and I see a lot of that, you know, I just got to call it for what it is right now. I see a lot of the anti-vax stuff also. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of, uh, I seen one image that was shared on social media. It said like colored uh, this way. And then, and then right underneath that in black and white in the same, like it was from the same time period of the Jim Crow era it says um, unvaxed this way. You know what I mean? And I looked at who was sharing it and it was some, some, you know, white anti-vaxxing, probably neo-confederate, you know, or anarchist or something like that, libertarian. Like, you know, these these are similar mindsets that that are that are we see that uh that have that you know you can see how those things have a lot in common. They're similar mindsets and they come from like the separation or uh not wanting to stay and let me say let me let me I wanted to say that and I want to switch back to what you were talking about Ali about why didn't he go back to Africa? Well, it's the same reason why we didn't Li- go back Li- to Africa. Liberia specifically. I, you can go ahead, but I got an article pulled up when we could share, and it's going to speak to exactly why he didn't go to Liberia. But go in, go in, Josh. Yeah, I see. That's the one I was talking about, Naeem. This is That's a racist. Talking- Only a racist could put this up and get away with it in today's black America because a lot of black Americans are siding with these right wing anarchists about this vaccine that has been politicized by Trump or the Trump administration, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm seeing a lot of our people, they are joining in the chorus of going at the Democrats, right? Yeah, well, in which we should keep pressure on that's them. Right. But... We should keep pressure on them, but when mm-hmm. we should never join the right wing in number one, the politic the politicization of the politicization <laughs> of a damn vaccine. Number one, if you're gonna join with them, you join with them when they become reparationists. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, watching yeah. people sharing right wing the propaganda from right wing people who are against reparations how is it that you're going to share this knowing that they have positions it's the garvey mindset that people don't know that they have yeah and and you know let me say another point to that right what uh i was i was talking with a, a partner of mine who libertarian right libertarian style of thinking he was telling me how the uh their their strategy was in terms of uh getting people from various sides of on the right and on the left to win them to like to win them into their way of thinking or to sympathize with them right so they said we'll we'll do is we'll outright the right and we'll out left the left right so what they do to the left is they'll they'll um talk about um how you 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 do doing so terrible with this criminalization of, of the drug laws. You need to decriminalize drugs. And so if you're a person that most people looked at as like a right wing, you know, person, and then you're the most right wing of right wing, but then you're you're out lefting the left by, you know, your position on on criminalization is oh, we need to decriminalize, you know, then man, some of those people might b- develop some affinity for that. And they'll they'll run with you and echo your message. And then you'll go turn around and go on the right. And saying, well, you know, why are you for these taxes here? Or why are you for that? Now, I can't think of a specific policy, but they, they, that's their strategy. They out right to right and out left to left. And then, then you find yourself uh, uh, being in alignment with their messaging, not, uh, not understanding like that most of these people are for or not definitely not uh, for your uplift and reparations. And a lot of them will share neo-Confederate uh, sentiments along with their policy and their ideology of just leave you leave you to starve you know and let 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 the big dog eat indeed so ali has an article he wants to pull up logic you did you you was about to say something yeah but go let ali go all right all right so this is from the new york times right this is an article regarding garvey's death um, and this was printed. Hold on, let me just see. Let me just see when this was. Let me go back. New York Times. What was this? Hold on, let me do this. Let me do this. And I'm gonna go back into it because I want to read 
uh, y'all know when Garvey died, man. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, this is when this is from when he died, Joe. And um, and this was a, a New York Times article. We could put the link in for you know people who don't believe it's real or whatever. But anyway, let me read about Garvey not going to Africa, particularly Liberia. Right in the middle of this page, you can see where it says, "When where Father Divine of a later day created angels and archangels among the colored population of Har uh, Harlem, Garvey in his time sprinkled the area with princes and princesses, barons, knights, vice, uh, viscounts, viscounts, earls, and dukes, and kept for himself a time uh, the comparatively humble designation of Sir provisional president of Africa. There was no evidence that he had ever set foot on that continent. And the Republic of Liberia was by announcement of his government closed to him and his followers. Mm. Mm. He blamed Ooh. the British and <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Liberia didn't want him or his followers to even come over there. Mm. According to yo, an man, announcement man, by his government, the government, yeah. yeah, you'll never hear him talk about that. Come on, this what we, this what we do here at BTP family. Just and, 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 think, and think about this, in, in accordance to what Ali just read, you know what I'm saying? The Constitution, man, you got to be doing something wrong when you can't get to Liberia because the, the <laughs> Constitution of Liberia. <laughs> allows for, for for people of the Negro race to become citizens, particularly, you know, those in, in America uh, that can come there. That's all you have to do there is stay there for a specific uh, period of time and you can become a Liberian citizen, you know, just, just by virtue of race. So for, for, for them to do that to Garvey them must show that they had some kind of serious trouble or problematic issue with, with Garvey and his works, man. Let me say something to Doc Phyllis, because he asked an amazing question. Yeah, he first says, what is know. Liberia? And Yes, Josh, he set it up real nice. He says, what is Liberia, and wh were they free of colonists? Hell no, they wasn't free. None of them people over there was free. And that's what makes this whole goddamn thing even crazier. The whole, Come on. Damn near all of them countries were still under colonization <laughs> Well, this man was talking about going back to Africa. What <laughs> kind of fucking sense does that make? Yo, he, he, wanted, he, wanted us to go, he wanted us to go back to Africa so we could get exterminated by Leopold. <laughs> you know Come what on, man. What? The Hitler of the Congo. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, he was worse than Hitler. But see, because we have romanticized the man, y'all can't even sit back and really digest these failures and the impact it has had on the freedmen people, right? And 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 anything that like you, you it, it it's a foreign concept that he comes and infiltrates our political atmosphere with, right? We were focused, and and people are coming from outside of our group and having us deviate off the path. I got to keep reiterating that that disconnect. I got to keep reiterating that. We are all we have. And we have, they didn't want him coming up over there because he going to try to take over their shit next. All the man do, he don't got no respect. You show, you seen that, how Philip Randolph introduced him to his crowd, being a nice, whole, uh, good freedman. Hey, brother, come on, let me show you some people that might want to hear what you got to say put you on, and instead of saying thank you, brother, how can I help the freedmen? You try to take everybody back to Africa. That's crazy. That's crazy. Back you, to I, a you... colonized place. But it's hey. so funny. My, uh, Ali, okay, I want bro. you to go in, but I pulled this comment up, powerful facts. But who is that in the image right there? That's another uh, <laughs> another mission <laughs> drift. I'm another not mission drift immigrant. Of another mission drift. <laughs> uh, a provocateur. Instead of siding with the freedman, and he's not a freedman. Instead of siding with the great Dr. King, who was the second king of the freedmen after Frederick Douglass, he come try to split the movement. Do and, and what do they all do again? 
they all represent aggregating the blackness because they're specific. They, that's what he do. Black power. Instead of doing civil rights justice work with Dr. King and all them geniuses over there, black power and start talking about uh, uh, and, and Dr. King, Dr. King really uh, undressed that man. And, and uh, where do we go from here? Hey, you don't got no program. You don't have no idea where you're trying to take the people. You're just doing a whole bunch of inflammatory rhetoric, getting the people all riled up. And you don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what you're doing because you haven't set up underneath the freedmen long enough. And, you, and, and instead of being our support, you want to be out in front and you're not even connected to this thing in the right way. They all uh, represent that. That's a fact. I, Ali, I didn't mean to cut you, bro. I just wanted to, it was so funny that I pulled that comment up and that was the, the image. He asked, you know, Stokely Carmichael, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, yeah, I didn't even see it. I missed it. Man. I was <laughs> I zoned out, man. But all of, look, let me say, family, all of these people represented mission drift. Our Freedman ancestors got it more right than they got it wrong. Then, and and mm -hmm. talk about how Hubert Harrison said Garvey inflated his numbers because people think Garvey's right. movement. That's Hubert right. Harrison said that dudes didn't have the amount of followers that he made everybody think he had. That's right. That's right. I mean, Hubert Harrison was there with Garvey. He really undressed that man in his critiques. I read uh, one of the critiques earlier from out of the book. I'm I'm hoping to get the author of what's this guy's name Perry. Is, is his last name Jeffrey B. Perry? Yeah, uh, he, he's a, a great historian, and I was hoping to get him on, on the platform one day so we could actually talk about um whiteness as a racial construct and how it led up to him even producing books on Hubert Harrison because you got to understand the difference between race and class. And you got to understand what the Democrats, the left wing of media have been doing to us, the foxes, right? Smiling in our faces and then getting us in the fox, whatever it's called, then and then chewing us the, the pieces, right? And, and then doing that to us every single generation. So, you know, we, we wanted to come on here and give, it's so much that we didn't even hit on yet. <laughs> it's so much that we didn't hit on as of yet. And nobody can't deny the fact that we are victims of mission drift. I know that it's hard. I've been following Noble Drew Ali for the last 10 years. I've been the chief champion. Of, but after a while, I'm doing my own research, battling with my brothers in, in debates where we've had over the past year, maybe really the past two years, it's like you can't deny the facts if that's what you're trying to stand on. You can stand on falsehoods, sure. But these people came and took us up the path. Even though the ones that were political, like Father Divine, it was so much other mystical nonsense to him that once his once he left, his movement faltered. And the people didn't know how to stand on their own two feet because he told them that he was God that manifested on earth. Where, where did he manifest that, Ali? Yo, this man, Father Divine, said he he was never <laughs> actually born. He said he manifested on 135th Street in Lenox Avenue. <laughs> man, that's so, crazy. So, so, look, Kwame Torre was a true advocate for black power. <clears throat> he was a pan-Africanist and surely meant all blacks well. As I said before, BTP are xenophobe, but you probably don't realize it. Realize it. Nativism produces this. Brother Logic, please uh, uh, address Yes, that. yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And, I don't, and, 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 and I don't be upset with old Logic after you say what he got to say. But I, I gotta keep it real, right? And what you got to understand, there, there, see, that's what they try to do. There, first of all, we are natives. You can call it nativism. You can that's call it right. what you want. But you're trying to turn something positive into negative, and that's a, that's a trait that we're exposing tonight that has historically always been there with people like you. You that's come right. and take things that are always have been positive for us and make them negative. There ain't nothing wrong with being a nativist. We are native, black Americans. That's we're right. We're this country. We're the freedmen. We're the That's reason right. why you're here. That's right. You understand? 
and that you can do the things that you do. You can't shame logic with that. And you can't come on here talking about oh, xenophobic because logic don't care about none of that. I'm terrified of anything that does not contribute to the, 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 the furthering, the prosperity, and the longevity of the freedman lineage in America. Anything that impacts that in a negative way. I'm terrified. Yes, I, why wouldn't I fear something that is compromising my prosperity and existence? You understand? I'm Come terrified on, of it. I have to address it. I have to look at Then just because that makes you uncomfortable, don't change the reality of that for me. Because that is, and, and when you use the word xenophobic, that's white supremacy. You understand? White folks exactly. made up them type of words. You understand? Because they fear the same thing. Anything that impacts their power position negatively. You understand? Anything that impacts their existence negatively. And so you want to white supremacist the freedmen and come and try to turn <laughs> everything that we do positive into something negative and then take over whatever, whatever we do have. Kwame Ture was wrong. Stokely Carmichael was out of pocket. And yes, it's absolutely because he's not native to here. That's the disconnect that leads him to not understanding that he's being disrespectful in the first place. If That's you right. don't know a meeting with the Ku Klux Klan is disrespectful because you don't have no family members that hang that hung by their ropes and, and, and were in flesh was set on fire by their torches. Yes, oh, it's a oh, native. Who had their thing. land stolen from them. You That's understand? right. Your your ancestors weren't raped by these people. You understand? So yes, it's a native thing. And, and we are proud natives of America. You understand? We've been fighting this good fight and this war since America was born. And you want to come over here and try to tell us how to talk about our story, how to fight for our justice, and, and, and just impose your way. You're an interloper. You understand? That's right. You are an interloper. You, and, and Go ahead, go bro. Ahead, no, no, go ahead, Ali. It's like it's like I said in that other video, the one that's circulating a little bit. The one thing you never find is African Americans going to Haiti, telling Haitians how to do their shit, trying to teach Haitians about their Haitian history. You don't see African Americans all up in the affairs of Jamaica. You don't see African Americans all up in the affairs of Trinidad and Tobago or none of that shit like that. That's something you don't never see us doing, right? Everybody thinks that for some reason that they have the right to come here and inject themselves into our affairs and not just doing that as an ally, but now I'm going to take over and I'm going to tell y'all what y'all are supposed to be doing with your shit. Ain't no, that's unprecedented, except yeah. for white people. The only people that do that kind of yes. shit is white folks. Yes, we African Americans don't go to nobody's fucking country trying to tell them what to do with their shit. Everybody think they can come and do that with us, though. Come on, and it man. ain't just black immigrants; it's Hispanic immigrants, it's white and all kind Asian immigrants. Everybody thinks that they can tell African Americans specifically how to do their business here. Even that though Kyrie dude just got blocked. My bad, Ali. I just blocked that Kyrie dude. Why? Because yeah. he said logic is an agent. He got to go. Don't oh. now, now you now you can't come back to the channel. Kyrie, Thank why you do that, man? Thank you. I, Thank I, I didn't, I didn't no, want Kyrie you know to what? get. I didn't want him to get blocked because I wanted to keep no, I don't addressing like, I don't that like stuff. That. I, I get I it. I like get it. But guess, good, guess, good, guess good. who was an agent? Garvey's best friend, who was his captain of his black <laughs> star right. line. That's was, right. That's right. That's who was an agent. You nigga, not logic. The fuck out of here, man. I'm out, man. These people crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I, I just I just gotta say, man, look, like this is America, and we're the freedmen, we're native black Americans. So, like the brother Lodge said, we gotta think about what is going to impact us in a positive or negative way. And our focus is not to like if you are in a swimming we you know you got to think about this thing right if you're in the swimming pool and you're drowning like you're you're on the bottom of the pool right you you got a little few breaths left before you you know or whatever the case may be you need to get yourself to the top of the pool you need to get uh some air 
You know what I'm saying? You need to get yourself out of the pool. How do you have time to to, to save somebody at the bottom of another pool or in another city? You know, you don't. So why why is it that? And it, and how could that's like you going underwater? You're going under the water, and you're you're holding up a sign that says, you know, you're selfish. You're just thinking about your 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 divisive. You're xenophobic. No, just come like work to help us get up from under at the bottom of the pool. And then when we can figure out how we can go and help some people in, uh, across town in another city or country at the bottom of a pool. Like that's that's what that's what you got to understand. Well, John, we are at the bottom well, of the bottom and you want us to fight an in fight uh, uh, an, an enemy or fight in systems uh defeat systems Let me that let me ask you, John. We let can't me, even look, beat the United States. Look, 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 let me ask you, right? How would things have differed if it was a Freedman administration in regards to those Haitians at the border? Do you think that we would have had racist devils on horseback whipping Haitians at the border and, and deporting them back to Haiti and not the illegal <laughs> immigrants? What are your thoughts on that? Come on, man. You already you know that. No, sir. That's right. So these people, happen. they're bugged out. They don't understand the importance of what we're doing here politically and why we can't focus on Pan-Africanism in the way that they want us to because it's more mission drift. It takes us away from the mission. That guy Logic debated Omawali Africa. This guy was, we got the videos and the audios of him saying that we should never vote. It's in his blogs. Why we should never vote. This dude is an American citizen who he claims he's a of of freedman descent. Oh. But I, I don't I don't I mean neither. I didn't believe it neither. Right. So oh, I'm about to say what the hell happened. <laughs> you got two grims <laughs> on the screen. So you know, we like let's these these people are bugged out, man. These people they don't understand what we're trying to do and why what we're doing is so important. They're trying hey, to ideologically stretch us thin. Go ahead, bro. This 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 is a, an example. What's going on with the Haitians at the border is an example of why they need to team with those people when they come here, not just Haitians, all of them. When they come here, they That's should right. be teaming up with us and, and, and falling in line because we're the ones that understand this shit. We went through this already. All that shit y'all seen them doing to them Haitians, we went through that. Our ancestors went through that and worse. Right. Went through that and worse. So they should be falling in line with us instead of coming here trying to be adversarial and thinking you're teaching us shit because you're not teaching us nothing. Let's just be real, real clear. You can suggest all the fucking books you want because I keep seeing niggas always, you need to read about this guy. Read about that. I don't give a fuck. It doesn't change nothing. <laughs> it doesn't change nothing. Reading a book that you suggest to me to read ain't going to change the facts of my history with my people in this country. I don't give a fuck what book you're telling me to read. It doesn't change nothing. Right. It doesn't change nothing. And you can't use that because they always want to use that to try to seem like, you know, we're intellectually above. You're not intellectually uh -huh. above shit because if you was that intellectual, you would have used all of that intellect to fix that shithole country that you came from. <laughs> All right, you don't gotta be here teaching me a goddamn thing. Let me go through my shit. You go back home, go through your shit. You ain't gotta come here trying to teach me a damn thing. Yeah, and and let me say this too, right? When we think about uh, what like the impact of let's say of uh, more immigrants coming across the border, like those people. I mean, it's interesting. They're cracking down on the Haitians coming in. Meanwhile, they bring in Afghanis That's over right. on airplanes. And, 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 and real, I'm going to let you finish, Josh. Remember you know where I'm going. what I brought up the other night with Sister Kelly, where she uh, posted that bill that the Congressional Black Caucus signed for undocumented workers right here in the United States. And yet they're kicking out the blacks who are Haitian, though. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, bro. Finish your point. And, and you, to throw you, that in you there. look at it. Yeah, if you look at the states that was some of the first people that, that signed up for the Afghanis to come in was like Kemp. That's you know, right. He was running to get some Afghanis in, right. in Georgia. And and if you look at uh who the, the you know the same red states are the ones that's trying to hurry up and get the Haitians out and make sure them Haitians don't come in. So I think they understand that 
if those people come, you know, obviously they're coming in the South, whether it be Texas or whatever. But hey, those people that are coming in, uh, I will. Hey, they need to get. They also need to go to Georgia. Bring, the, put them in Georgia. Put them in uh, Louisiana. Put them in Alabama. Put them all in South Carolina, North Carolina. Put them in them Southern states because uh, we need we need additional numbers. I think you know. I said this before, and we can we can debate on this. I know this is a little bit off topic, but we see what those Haitians dealt with. Now maybe they see. <laughs> And, and and a and a lot of them are already understood a little bit, but now they see because because a lot of them coming from the being at the bottom and and that's an extremely poor country. But a lot of them now they can see what it is with us uh, and and who, who, who and what they're up against in America. And you need to side with us as we build up our numbers. We need to build up our numbers so we can get power in the in the southern states. You know, with our uh, Freedman Southern strategy. That's right. Brother Grimm. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, just you know, let, let's let's give a recap on on what we what we've learned tonight, you know. And I I want to pull this image up just to give people a reminder of like we we spoke about Garvey, Drew Ali, and Elijah Muhammad. And his protege Malcolm, you know, going with the clan. We we're seeing and witnessing that today. There's still mission drift going on. If you look at a lot of the people, Reza Islam, right? He's got a picture with Alex Jones, a straight right wing fascist nut. They're the same people, and they they are those who made what was what's that phrase, Grim? A, a pack with hell and a covenant with death. I believe it goes. Are right. you familiar with that? These yeah, are the sure. people that said they have made a, a pack with hell and a covenant with death when it came to our people. Y'all better understand what y'all looking at. These people, their progeny is here today. They've learned new and effective ways to get at us. And now all of a sudden we're siding with these people. These people swore themselves to be our enemies when Trump won, especially in Georgia. Georgia is trying to make it so that no other Democratic, I mean, Trump lost. No other Democratic president could win again. And they're doing that by suppressing the black vote. I've had people right. tell me, no, that's not what they're doing. Trying to convince me that what I'm reading from these bills and the commentary thereof is not what I'm reading, seeing, and hearing. I mean, come on. Indeed. And, you know, brother, I want to say, because, you know, we've basically been talking about uh, in our conversations in regards to this topic in private, you know, and all of our experience, me, yours, uh, Ali's, Josh, mine, you know, with the uh, uh, Moorish movement, um, uh, mine with the Moorish movement, the UNIA and other things. And we go, we, we, we were basically went into a uh, uh, Bible verse. And I want to uh, read that Bible verse real quick, man. In regards to this, these people, the triad that we talked about, and if you're just tuning into the show, the triad is Marcus Garvey, Noble Drew Ali, and Elijah Muhammad. And you know, we was kind of like thinking about it, and basically, uh, uh, Jesus in the Bible, he said, in um, what is that, John, uh, uh, uh chapter 10. You know, verse, what is that, verse 8? And he said, uh, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Mm. You know, I, I, that verse, you know, basically made me think about these so-called people that we all used to call masters, teachers. And just like Jesus said about all the rest of them guys, you know, uh, we saying it today. All that came before us, man, are basically, man, thieves and robbers. And when I go back to my travels and I 
think about the people I believed in, the Farrars, the Elijahs, the Drew Ali's, the Marcus Garvey's, the list goes on, right? And when you start to think about this in accords with the divine, the supreme and divine mission of the freedmen, you begin to realize that those guys that came before were thieves and robbers, man. And, uh, you know, and another thing, you know, in particular with the Moors, <laughs> I, I think about this verse, you know, ye are of your father, the devil, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, and I think about that. And I think about how all of this stuff is interrelated, right. And how these guys were basically taking us off our mission. And I don't want to get off of the topic, but when I think about Drew, and I think about Elijah and how we looked at these guys as uh, masterminds. And basically, you know, we had free men and freedmen and women basically who had knowledge, but we just didn't appreciate the knowledge. So, you know, like me and Naheem was talking, you know, we basically kind of like grew up and coming up in knowledge, despising people like W.E.B. Du Bois, despising people like Dr. King, um, uh, despising the likes of people like uh, Philip Randolph and uh, all of the different types of freedmen, freedom fighters, because we thought that Drew had the answer. That's right. And, and, and Father Allah and Elijah right. Muhammad. Etc. Elijah Muhammad. We thought these guys had the answer, but you know what I'm saying? They had they basically had freedmen who had the knowledge of our ancient history and our connections in our modern history and our connections to the ancients. Like we was talking about Drusilla Dungy Houston, who was also at one point affiliated with the uh, Garvey movie. She movement. She wrote that book, uh, uh, wonderful Ethiopians of the Kushite empire. And then we also talk about, uh, uh, Robert Benjamin Lewis, who wrote an exhaustive history upon our race and even making a Moorish connection like 40 years, 40 years before Noble Drew Ali was even born, you know? Facts. And, Facts. and, and, and then, like, we talked about the, the Islamic aspect of this thing, right? And the Islamic aspect, we know that when our people, a lot of our people who were exiled from the uh, African continent came over here. Many of them, you know, studied the, the native spirit, the uh, aboriginal spiritual knowledge and from that, from the continent. But then we had some of our brothers who were Muslims and Islamic. And I think it was Ali or, or Naheem, y'all, one of y'all made the statement that um, pre 1920s or uh, 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 Islam, was uh anti-confederate but post 1920 uh islam was basically uh pro-confederate you know that's and right. that's how we get these ideas of elijah muhammad and the uh, uh the the ideas and concepts of black degradation you know that and, and people realize that all these guys always talk about this black this black that black that then when you look at minister farrakhan he got straight hair you follow what he got permed here and all of his followers yep. or whatever who's trying to imitate him just making a point who try to imitate him they'll go get this waves in the point into the the perms i meant and the hair slicked down well where does that come from you understand what i'm saying that comes from a concept in the actual anti-black teaching that exists in Elijah Muhammad's teachings that taught that basically uh, black people hair was straight and that they knew slavery was coming. One of the, the scientists or whatever or elders knew that the uh, 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 the uh, uh, the slavery was coming. So they took a bunch of black people and put them in Africa and then they cursed them or whatever with with kinky hair and all of that stuff. And in uh big lips and big noses so they can be strong enough to withstand the slave trade. <laughs> this this anti 
African philosophy that is inside of the teachings of, 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 of the latter day Islam, you know, and, right. and people don't really like see these things and the statements of Drew Ali saying, yo, you guys are not African. You are Asiatic. You follow what I'm saying? And, uh, tied in with, with Garvey and what Garvey said about our people. I'm saying all of these things so people could understand the lineal descent of how all of this stuff is connected and how easy that these people are basically the fathers of what we call the conscious community. Right. And the bottom line is that when you really understand the roots of those philosophies, that's why it's so easy for right wing people, I mean, uh, conscious community people to adopt a That's lot right. of right talk to them, bro. talk to them, you know, and ideology. So basically, here it is this coronavirus. Thing. Everybody was afraid of this coronavirus white, black, brown, red, yellow, pink, orange, green, right? When it first came out, nobody knew what it was. But then we basically had this uh, media come on and the media started reporting these stats. And y'all think about how this shit went down because the media started compiling these stats and all they couldn't wait to get on TV to talk about how coronavirus was killing black people, killing black people. Oh, mostly black people are dying for me. And notice that, notice that when the coronavirus thing uh began to become a uh black person's um disease or a lot of black people was dying from it that's when all of the right wingers started coming forward and that's right didn't they didn't want to wear masks that's right they didn't want shit to close down that's they didn't right. want a closure that because and, and, and they realized that some people were asymptomatic mm -hmm. so a lot of those people who hates you was hoping that they were asymptomatic carriers to give it to your diabetic ass. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying? And your overweight ass. So you mm -hmm. can basically die of the coronavirus. See, anti-blackness has its root. Confederate, modern Confederate ideology has its root even in this public health issue of the coronavirus. So what are conscious community people, anti-vaxxers and all of this stuff? They're picking up from the same people, right? That a lot of the fathers of the conscious community had a philosophical affinity for. And that's why it's so easy for us to adopt those things, man. Hey, Grim, right. hey, Grim I'm out on that. I ain't got nothing else to say after that, bro. <laughs> you know? All right. Peace, Freeman. Hey, man, I'm uh, yeah, I wish to stay on a few while, a little while, Josh. But look, no, I'm done. Hey, you Grim, said I ain't Grim, got nothing else quick. to say. You just burnt it, Grim. Real quick, Grim. Remember when the coronavirus first comes out, the only deaths that were reported was white folks because they were the only ones traveling. So we, like a lot of people, thought this was a white man's disease, and some people were were happy, you know, that that was going on, and and we seen a lot of memes. Going on, going up. As soon as I think the first black man that got reported on was from Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. And then it was an avalanche of our people, and th the fear then waned, and they were right. able to shift the blame on our people. What did the lieutenant governor of Texas say? African Americans are the ones out here spreading the coronavirus. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. So, so the thing about the sad part about it is like we got the the uh, uh, the stats, the numbers, and now we got these people saying, and I, I'm not trying to get into the the, the 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 vaccine, no vaccine thing, but the it's the uh, a lot of the right wing people who are basically anti vaxxers I mean, it's a fact. Is and then a lot of our people are uh, we studying. And we are being influenced by a lot of the, the bogus uh, uh, COVID-19 things uh, uh, out there. And it's conscious community people that's spreading that shit. 
So and yeah. I, I'm just saying that I'm yeah. making it as an example of how uh, Garvey, uh, Ali, and Drew was the father of these communities, these conscious communities that basically now uh, accept a lot of right wing ideology because the triad accepted. And that's basically the point that uh mm. that I, I when we clar clarify what you mean by triad, Grim, for the those that's just coming in. It's Garvey. Garvey gave his ideas and concepts, gave birth to the concepts uh, of, of Drew Ali. Um Ali read the whole thing about the, the trains and we shouldn't be on the trains. Then we have uh noble Drew Ali or well, Garvey, noble Garvey Drew Ali. said the I'm trains. Talking. Huh? Garvey said the trains about yeah, we didn't build the trains, train. so we, we should talk about mm -hmm. we shouldn't because the white man built them, which oh. is another lie. <laughs> you know, we built the railroad right. system. That's right. And uh uh you have Drew Ali with his statements in support of Jim Crowism, and then we have a whole lot of Elijah Muhammad statements that in some shape, form, or fashion is in support of segregation, Jim Crowism. You know, we have him putting his agents up. To meet with the Ku Klux Klan and the whole plethora of other uh uh anti you see a lot of people don't even know and I lost this article that um you know well I'm not gonna go there but you know people want to talk about xenophobes but in one of the uh old Muhammad speaks newspapers you know um Elijah Muhammad told his followers not to even marry Africans that's but, right man, I remember that there. that's right that was in the Muhammad Speaks That's movie. right. That's so, right. You know, but the, but the triad is those three. Garvey, Drew, Ali, and Elijah Muhammad, who basically spread a lot of erroneous information. And like that brother, what's his name? Richard uh, said, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that stuff has basically uh, set our people back, man, 75 to 100 years for adopting, even if they're not direct followers, of, of Garvey, Drew, and Ali, a lot of people accepted directly those, or uh, 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 indirectly those philosophies or whatever that has this implication in, in our uh, political weakness, man, and economic right. and social weakness. That's well, right. the problem, the problem with segregation, as it was, was a political and economic problem. Um, you saying as long as long as we have equity and reparations, that's fine with me. Yeah, I I, I get that, Cato. I no, think, he's um, he's responding to somebody in the chat though that's talking yeah. about. But I just wanted to just mm, make the point that that, bad, bro. that I think um, segregation. If if you had equality, if you had access, right? The problem for us during segregation was a lack of access. Right. You, you know, all of these rights of citizenship that were being blocked from us. So that was the problem with segregation and the whole concept of separate but equal being not uh, having to go in front of the Supreme Court because the, the, the stuff was not separate and equal. And so even though as taxpayers, we still contribute into this country and and and, um, and you know, in the economy as as uh, as debtors and consumers we still didn't have access to the citizenship and the rights of it the way we were supposed to. And, and, you know, we can go into Jim and we can go into uh, redlining, you know, and all of those things and how that stuff affected our people in terms of our wealth position, et cetera. So segregation definitely had its problems politically and economically, you know what I mean? So that's the problem with, but yet repar I don't, you know, if reparations and equity and, and ownership and, 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 uh, corporations and, and and so forth if, if that would cure the issue i don't know i don't know that necessarily ownership and having money is going to cure the political problems per se that you may encounter with segregation but yeah so this was the article um this was also an article i believe this was uh coming from uh a philip randolph's publication uh, what was the name of his publication? Hold on one second. I think it's the Crusader. Is it not the Crusader? Whatever it is. Anyway, this is A. Philip Randolph's publication, right? And they um, 
ran an article about Garvey in here, and I just wanted to read that real quick before we get off. Um, and it's also, again, talking about the Ku Klux Klan. So let's just go through that a little bit. Let me um, go to the actual thing. So, so here, it says, 2,000 Negroes here Garvey denounced. Speaker declares ex-president general is an ally of the Ku Klux Klan. Rallying to the cry of Marcus Garvey must go, nearly 2,000 Negroes, members of the Friends of Negro Freedom, which was um, a full of Randolph and them's uh, organization, meeting yesterday afternoon in Douglas Hall, which was at uh, Lenox Avenue and 142nd Street. For those who don't know, Douglas Hall was right where uh, the Cotton Club, the original Cotton Club, was at the same location, 142nd and Lenox. Listen to speakers denounce Garvey as an ally of the Ku Klux Klan, a robber of ignorant Negroes and a demagogic charlatan. Dr. Robert, ba uh, Robert Bagnall, organizer for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, who spoke on the madness of Marcus Garvey, denounced the leader of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, who resigned his post of president general last Saturday and said the Negro leader had made a failure of every business venture he touched, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars belonging to persons who trusted him. He opposed Garvey's Back to Africa movement as impractical, visionary, and ridiculous. The chairman, A. Philip Randolph, announced that the meeting was the third of a series of four designed to create opinion among Negroes against Garvey. He said that similar meetings would be held all over the United States in a crusade to drive Garvey from communities where Negroes reside. Dr. Bagnall aroused great applause when he compared Garvey to Don Quixote battling with windmills. And, and when you read a little bit of that story, what you find is that Don Quixote was someone who was fighting windmills because he thought windmills were like some kind of monster but he, he kept losing the fight. It, it's crazy. So he says uh, he has misled poor ignorant Negroes. He said promising them a competence for life from their investments in uh, his enterprises. Replying to Garvey's assertions that his enemies were tools of white people, Dr. Bagnall declared Garvey to be inspired by those midnight assassins, the Ku Klux Klan. He declared that Garvey must go because like Judas Iscariot, he sold himself for 30 pieces of silver in order to curry favor with the Klan. The speaker referred to Garvey's reported visit to Atlanta and to the statement credited to Garvey's secretary that the Ku Klux Klan might rehabilitate the Black Star Line by investing money in it and said Garvey tells you to accept the Ku Klux Klan at its face value. He tells you not to oppose the Klan, which has lynched you and robbed you again and again. That's Garvey, the leader who shows himself a cowardly, whining adventurer, an individual of doubtful honesty, and a demagogic charlatan. That's the, that's the end of that article. And I, I want to do this, Ali. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to come. I want to go back for those of you who have just came in. I want to go back because this is we're at the end, and I want to recap. Because many people can say, and they could be within their rightful means for saying that A. Philip Randolph and those black boule, talented tent types, et cetera, et cetera, they were against Garvey. But these critiques are coming from several different places. Even what was the the African Blood Brotherhood? African Blood Brotherhood was headed up old. by a couple of um, immigrants, black immigrants. Uh, Caribbeans, yep. Caribbeans, and, and 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 freedmen were in that group, but it was headed up by Caribbeans. They had a critique. Uh, again, let's read from, I believe, the greatest immigrant ally, ally we've ever had, and Hubert Harrison. That's that's my personal belief. He says. By the 1920 convention, however, a campaign was underway to have Harrison dismissed from the editorship of the paper because he was the publisher of the editor and publisher of Garvey's The Negro World. He was the brain. He was the mind behind most of everything that Garvey did. This man right here, Hubert Harrison. Y'all make sure y'all look him up. It says Harrison in turn 
was highly critical of Garvey and worked against him. His criticism concerned the extravagance of Garvey's claim. See, this guy was breaking down how Garvey was inflating his numbers of 4 million worldwide members. Remember, Garvey was making a claim that a lot of those members was in Africa. But we just read from a source earlier where Garvey claimed that the people in Africa were savage and backwards. Right. Anyway, anyway it says, uh, let me see. His Okay, his, his criticisms concerned the extravagance of Garvey's claims, his ego, the conduct of his stock-selling schemes, and his political practices. Though Harrison continued to write columns and book reviews for the Negro world in 1922, their political differences grew, and he sought to develop political alternatives to Garvey. In particular, Harrison urged, pay attention, y'all, <clears throat> Harrison urged political action in terms of electoral politics, attempted to build an all-black liberty party to run African-American candidates for political offices, including the presidency, consistently maintained the position that African-Americans' principal struggle was in the United States and that they should therefore not seek to develop a state in Africa, opposed imperialism, and did not seek an African empire, argued that Africans, not African Americans, would lead struggles in Africa, vociferously opposed the Ku Klux Klan, whom Garvey met with, and Ali was just reading the story about what A. Philip Randolph and them reported about that meeting, and favored reason, science, and fact-based knowledge over emotional appeals and exaggerated claims to the masses. So this man was saying what we say at Be The Power, educate yourself, become the facts with the power as well. Not get caught up in a bunch of preacher man hype because if we chose to, we can do that too. But that will lead us nowhere. It will lead us right back into the slow, quicksand-like thinking of a lot of the people that followed Garvey in the 1920s. Was there a silver lining to some of that stuff? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm not going to speak for everybody. I'm going to say there was in, in some ways, right? But the overall elements of it, they were no good for us. Hey, uh, Naheem, pull mm -hmm. up Doc Phyllis's comment. I, the, man, the I wish you, I wish we had time to talk to this brother because hey, it seemed look, like it seemed okay. like he trying to say the clans had some good ideology. You you read from Nate Cloran or something? Like I don't know, I don't understand. Like, what are you doing? You're defending the clan. I don't, I don't really get what you're saying. We're reading articles. These are things that were published in the 1920s. Like you saying, we we keep bringing up the clan. These are things that were published mm -hmm. decades before any of us were even born. What do you mean we keep bringing up the clan? These are the things that they were concerned with. The brothers and the Caribbean members of the African Blood Brotherhood were concerned with Garvey's meeting with the clan. They wind up falling out with Garvey as members of the UNIA. They wind up falling out with him over his meeting with the Klan. These were guys from the Caribbean. You had African-Americans who had a problem with him meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. They wound up falling out with this man over his meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. This is stuff that happened in the 1920s. This is not something, it's not about us continuously bringing up the Klan. I don't give a fuck about the Klan. This is what's in the articles. We're just reading the damn articles. So if you wanna come on, uh, Mr. Phileas, and tell us how the Ku Klux Klan is some kind of great organization or whatever the fuck. I don't know the point that you're trying to make. BPP and the NOI met with them as well. Okay, so what? So, it, so what? Yeah, and we, we said that, you know, we, yeah, said, we said that. that. I mean, we said that. <laughs> I said it time and time again that the triad, which is Garvey, Ali, and Drew, are infamous for a uh, 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 meeting with the Ku Klux Klan. So, I mean, 
you ain't saying nothing by saying that the, the nation of Islam, like that's a justification. None of them son of a gun shouldn't have never met with no Klansmen at all, period. Fact. You know? Right. And so, then these are the very people they're looking for help from the Ku Klux Klan. But these are the very tell you we don't need no white man to help us build this and that. You got to do for self. What the fuck you mean with the clan for if this is about do for self, nigga? What you talking about? <laughs> you know, and, and, and we we've studied this we've studied this document in great. Yeah, they detail. depending on the clan. <laughs> I'm sorry, Graham. Go ahead, bro. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> nah, uh, uh, Ali. I just was saying, like you and I, you know, we we uh. We've studied in great detail J.B. Stoners, who was the uh, Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and his letter to Elijah Muhammad and his letter back, and and he let Elijah Muhammad know how how he feel about you know the, about uh, black uh, the Muhammadan religion as he called it, and the yep. Negroes and the Negro race and all of that kind of stuff. So I mean, it really wasn't why why the hell that they have to meet with them clansmen. You know what I'm saying? He told it. J.B. Stoner told Elijah how he felt. You right. know? And he was like, he will, they, they'll fill a hell with Mohammedans. You know? So, I mean, man, it's just crazy. I, I just want to make one more comment, too. Just, you know, how we get uh, sidetracked by this, this mission drift, you know? And, you know, I also want to mention, like, the Rastafarians in that regard. We know that they... You know that that religion wasn't founded by freedmen, but like a lot of freedmen embraced that religion. And you know, I just want to point out, you know, in my opinion, another uh, fallacy, you know, uh, of Rastafarianism, because like the Rastafarian brothers basically set Garvey up as a prophet, and you know, most of our Rastafarian brothers believe that His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie was uh god incarnate or god in person right but like when you study it when they say that think garvey made a statement say look to africa where a black king rise up and a lot of the rastafarian brothers say that that was a prophecy of garvey about you know holly selassie's coronation you know and that's a fallacy because like when you do research about uh the relationship between um, Marcus Garvey and Haile Selassie, you'll find out that Marcus Garvey, you know, was a was a critic of Haile Selassie during the war, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I'll just read it just so it could be clear. Um, no doubt. Uh, let's see. Let's see. They said. Um, Okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, y'all. Let me, let me, I'm looking for it. But basically, during the war, uh, Emperor, you know, Emperor Haile Selassie had made some things, some, it, some moves that Garvey basically uh, considered uh, questionable, right? So in 1935, during the Second Italo Ethiopian War had broken out, and Italy invaded Ethiopia. Garvey spoke out against the Italians, but he praised the government of Selassie, right? But, you know, by that October, you know, he was becoming increasingly critical of uh, Haile Selassie, uh, basically blaming his lack of preparedness for Ethiopia's failure in the war. So when Haile Selassie fled the home, his homeland and arrived in Britain, Garvey was among black delegates who arranged to meet him at the Waterloo Station, but Garvey was rebuffed. From that point, he became more openly hostile to Haile Selassie, describing him as a feudal monarch who looks down upon his slaves and serfs with contempt and a great coward who ran away from his country to save his skin. So, you know, if Haile Selassie is God and Marcus Garvey is this prophet who prophesies the coming of this God king from Africa, Haile Selassie, then why is he talking about him like a dog? You know, that's right. You know, that's and right. that that goes to that goes to show you. You know, another another quote that <laughs> that's right. Somebody said Selassie is a a god, but can't defeat Italy. Okay, right. Well, <laughs> I don't believe that. That's what they believe. 
no, no, that's what, yeah, that, oh. he's he's being facetious. Oh, okay. Like, dude exactly. can't defeat Italy. Right, <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, that's a that's an excellent point. So, you know, with that being said, man, it goes to show you how, you know, we was talking about these quotes, man, about these people, right, raising up. And what, what was the quote that we said? Um, um, Many shall come in my name saying I am Christ. And that's uh -huh. basically what we did right. with, man. Supreme mission drip. That's right. So, look, we got Doc, right. Doc Felis on. So, let me pull his comment up because we, we're going to start here. At Be The Power. Y'all are sitting here talking about civil rights as a solution, and the white man <clears throat> has shown you his playbook. Break break that down for us and everybody that's listening. But Doc I have Phyllis. a question that I, Doc Phyllis, where's your family from, brother? Tuskegee, Alabama, Macon County, to be exact. So you're a freeman. I don't even know what that is, but you know, if it it falls in line with uh, being. Having your folks have roots in, the, in America, that's fine. Your your family is descendants of s informal slaves in America? Yeah. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So go ahead. W break down what you were saying. So firstly, I want to say what I agree with or what you, what you guys were talking about. First off, I want to say I do agree that people who come from other countries shouldn't be able to come in and tell us what we need to be doing because we're here on the ground and we have an understanding of what it takes. But that understanding also includes the failure of civil rights, the failure of uh, Title IX, the failure of everything that, that we tried to bring that has been taken over by all these other groups, including immigrants. And I'm saying, if we're looking at the Klan, and I, I'm, I know that you guys didn't bring it up specifically for the, you only brought it up for this discussion. You didn't bring it up as, uh, part of your 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 uh you know your anti-philosophy i know it just particularly pertains to this topic but i'm bring, i'm i'm responding to it because as a general i don't i don't know the uh the, the intricacies of the clan i don't know their bylaws and all of that i just know as at what they present themselves to be as a segregationist organization who does for themselves who feeds themselves and and looks out for their interests we should be trying to do that rather than trying to work ourselves through the court. When I say the white man has shown us his playbook, what I mean is, is that he's shown that none of this, none of your specificity matters. None of, none of your, I'm going to call myself a freedman matters. None of that matters. As long as your ass has black skin, as long as your ass is different than him and, and cannot acquire power in, the, in a real way, then all of this other stuff has been proven. Okay, to, okay, to okay, 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 okay. Let's let's get to some some back and forth now. So, what do you propose? So, my proposal is the same thing that that, that the Haitians should have done after the Haitian Revolution, right? So, when they pushed the French back, they had control over the the sugar cane, right? And Toussaint Louverture presented the idea that they should be the num the world's number one sugarcane producer. But the Negroes were so lazy, you know, I I'm saying lazy because they had freedom. Part of being free is the option of laziness. That's what I wrote in the comments. So when, when people get mad that I call black people lazy, I'm saying that's an option. When you are free, laziness is an option. So Negroes didn't want to work the land. Negro Negroes... So, wait, let me. I'm, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. I, and I don't mean to interrupt. So, are you saying that black people should have in America, basically, if if I'm correlating, if, if I'm making the proper correlation, we should have stayed picking picking cotton for ourselves, correct? You know what? A row of our own would never have hurt us. Yeah, definitely. Okay. We should have controlled okay. the crops that we could control, okay. and definitely died and fought to keep so, our land instead of selling it off. Okay, no, no, I, I hear you. So, can you um, express the differences between the Haitian Revolution and many of the slave revolts that happened in the South? What, what, what is your knowledge on on those two events, and and how do you see them as similar? And do you see them as similar? Do I see them as similar? I see them similar in the sense that. 
we had our own communities. That's why I see a, a, they had theirs through fighting through fighting the French. They had their own internal communities. We had our own t internal communities upon being freed as slaves. So meaning that we had our own schools. We, you know, you you know, you know the litany of things that we had. I don't need to go through it. So the point of what I'm saying is, is that we need to go back to that. We need to go back to self reliance. We need to go back to self governance of our own community. Of course, it's going to be internal. I wrote. The, I also wrote this in the comments as well. So you guys are talking about. Uh, I don't know if you were talking about it, but internal socialism and external capitalism. So that's 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 the idea. We should we should be communicating with each other globally and and internally. So like when the brother Josh was saying, uh, what did the brother Josh say? He said we want. He's saying that the idea of Pan Africanism is saying that we should be concerned with black people abroad before we're concerned with black people in america and that's that's never been the idea of, of pan-africanism the idea of pan-africanism is a yes it is global unity but it also includes us working on what we got here in in, in the united states i don't know where this whole idea all right all right of, all right all right bro all right it's, can, can, can i can i address uh, some of that <laughs> go ahead bro because <laughs> i i saw some of the comments and they, they basically took the wind out of my sails but i just want to say this right do you know what they did to the Haitian economy and why the Haitians are in the condition that it's in today? Teach me. You talk. You talking about the tariffs? Are you talking about like you talking about uh, sanctions that they couldn't export? They couldn't trade with other countries. What right. They couldn't. About? They couldn't do that. So just like the uh, the elder just um uh, uh pointed out, he just his 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 thing was just on the screen. The elder just pointed out that just because you have something that, you know, they don't mean that it's a market for it, right? So they can produce all the sugar cane, what they will trade it amongst themselves. You know, it's no market for it, you know? So the the bottom line of it is this. So alternatively, so since you said that, alternatively, so since they couldn't trade other, other, other places, since we're talking about civil rights, what was their civil rights option to be able to trade worldwide? You don't. Well, well you, when you talking the, about the only option is military. Wait, hold, hold on, on, brother. Hold, hold on, on, brother. Hold, hold on, on. Hold now. On. Hold on. Now, here's the thing. You talking about civil rights, which shows that. That's not what I'm talking not, about. That's what y'all are talking about. I'm, I'm you just brought it up, bro. Brought Chip. Up. All right, look, we got mutual. Let, let's let. Yeah. You so, gotta be respectful, bro. So here's the thing. You're talking about civil rights, right? When you're talking about civil rights, you're talking about something that was germane to us here because there was a constitutional government that was set up there was a second second founding of the united states of america which is the reconstruction movement right so that's what you're talking about with civil rights you can't equate that to haiti because it ain't really have nothing to do with the civil rights they actually overthrew their oppressors and set up their own government correct so with that being said, we're talking about the the actual markets. And see, that's the problem with this whole bootstrapperism is, is regard to what you was talking about, the sugar cane and stuff like that. And you called the blacks lazy, right? Well, think about this. Those people have been growing that shit all of their lives, just like black people have been growing cotton and shit all of their lives. They was fucking sick of that shit. So, you, you know, you basically telling somebody to uh, engage in uh, a, 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 a practice that a lot of people, they may not have been lazy, but they may have been psychologically opposed to those trades. You understand what I'm saying? And when somebody's dealing with the psychological issue, you can't tell, say that that person is lazy just because they didn't want to participate in the craft that was forced upon them by they uh 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 they slave masters right like for example my mother she grew up poor and that's all they ate was oatmeal now to this day my mother won't eat any oatmeal my, Once my, she, hey my mother is like that with grits grim right she won't exactly. eat grits to this they, day they she, she cooked that. it for us right so <laughs> my 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 father-in-law you follow what i'm saying 
he won't eat seafood because that's all his mother would do was bring home freaking seafood. So how you gonna say somebody that's all they brought home was cotton and you say, oh man, if y'all niggas were so fucking lazy, we would be able to sell. And then like the brothers pointed out in the chat that there were embargoes on uh, uh, Haiti. In fact, Haiti didn't stop paying the French back to what? The, if I'm not mistaken, what, the 40s? So you meant what, what you're saying, brother man, is not really making sense. Now, what you said something about about Pan Africanism and the idea of Pan Africanism. What you said about that, and we will address that. Let, let Ali. I know Ali is. is uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Ali. Go ahead. Let Ali get in. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it, it it's it's all good because. We kind of talked about this stuff on Dr. Ma'at's channel when we talked to Ashar Imhotep. The same, this 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 Pan-African thing, right? It's it's a it's a nice idea. I'm not against Pan-Africanism, right? I'm not against it, but I'm not really for it because it's just an idea, and it's an idea that has been around for at least a hundred years, over a little over a hundred years now. It's not brand new. The people on the continent can't manifest it. The people in the Caribbean can't manifest it. People come here and try to heap all of this stuff on African-Americans like the onus of, of making this shit work is on us. That's not true. I will never accept that. And, and, and at the same time, when you talk about specificity doesn't matter, it does matter. It's the very reason why they import in certain black people to advance them, up, advance them in different fields past us. Because if specificity didn't matter, they would invest in Black Americans. They wouldn't need to go to Nigerians and British Nigerians and all of these different people to bring them in, to put them over us, utilizing the programs and set aside that was, was fought for by our ancestors that you mentioned earlier in, the, in, in your commentary. So no, specificity does matter, particularly as it relates to the issue of justice for the things that our people went through during slavery, into Reconstruction, into Jim Crow, into the fucking Great Recession and everything else that we went through in this country. Voter suppression, redline and all that stuff. Specificity does matter. To you, it may not matter. Maybe you don't understand why it matters. But for us who understand the, the plight that we went through and who understand that that plight undergirds our call for justice, Yes, it matters. Hell yeah, it matters. It, it, it doesn't. Can I, can I, it, it, go, ahead, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Make your point. OK, so there's a second undergirding that you're not recognizing. There's an undergirding of an extra governmental structure that governs even even when we do the things that you're suggesting. Right. Even when we fight for civil rights, even when we create the legislation, even when we get it passed and, and create it, because there's a second undergirding organization of people that pushes the government it doesn't matter what we produce you understand what i'm saying it doesn't matter that we separate ourselves as a different group what matters is is what can we do and what can we protect what what can we physically so do you basically call it for armed revolution i'm not saying an armed revolution i'm saying armed revolution in response to us be our our inability to to work it in the system that y'all are saying so i'm not saying nobody should be should should try to work laws i'm not saying that i'm saying recognize the history recognize that the real currency of change is is the skin that you carry the real currency that has allowed all these separate groups y'all talked about the irish earlier not being uh considered white y'all talked about the irish because they have the I, the complexion for protection, they are able to work the system in a manner that inculcates them and makes them protected. We we don't have that option. We have never had that option. Right, but so here, no matter I'm, what I'm saying, no matter what you create, it can be right, taken right, from right. you. No matter no, what you no, listen. create, it can be taken from you. Yeah, but Pan-Africanism ain't going to stop that. If it was going to stop that, it would have stopped it already. This is why I don't understand why y'all keep arguing that. That, that's not going to that has not even helped them Africans over there. Like when they listen, when the Africans got up out of colonialism in the 50s and the 60s, it took them that long to get out of colonialism. It wasn't no pan-Africanism that helped them get up out of that shit. So so here's what I'm saying. 
here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Our people, the advances that we've made in this country, whatever, however you want to look at them, whether that's the Reconstruction Amendments, the, the, the winning of the Civil War, because a lot of people don't understand without the Negro involvement in the Civil War, the Union would have lost that war. And the American Revolution as well. That, damn straight. So without that, without the work that our people did, Mega Evers and others, to bring about the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s, without them doing that, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have any kind of advancement. So the people have to listen. This is our legacy. That's what we do. We've been doing that. We've been fighting for justice. You know why? Because it's our country. It's it's just as much or more so our country as it is any of these white people, most of whom are immigrants, trying to tell us that it's not and that we should go back to Africa. Most of them white people. What, what is us your, that what are, is your mechanism? Immigrants. What is Go your ahead. mechanism for enfor what is your mechanism for for enforcing that? For enforcing what? Everything that you just suggested. You said that the world wouldn't have these benefits if it weren't for us fighting for not the world, uh, us here. I'm talking about us in this country. Right. In this country. Us yeah. in this country. Well, no, we say I'm saying the world because immigrants benefit from it too. So the world is included. Okay, I get your point. So those people benefit or the, the mechanism is the same thing that it's been the whole time. It's been political action. We, exactly. how else did we get it? The Civil War was the was the last time that I can think of where we actually physically fought for liberation. Physically, after the Civil War, everything else was done through political means. So through political means, you were able to get Civil Rights Act of eighteen sixty six. The, the reconstruction amendments after the after the war then you then you keep moving forward to the laws and legislation even the, even the cases think about this even the cases um Thurgood Marshall these landmark cases this man using his brain was able to make certain maneuvers inside of the supreme court so it I don't think it's a dead issue for us to try to use our brain and our political action and our civic engagement to continue moving forward. I just think that mission, like we've been talking about, mission drift has made our people go off track, right? And Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanism, having our people looking towards Africa, Afrocentrism, all of this kind of stuff is mission drift. It takes our people off of the things that we're supposed to be doing right here, the same way Hubert Harrison said back in those days. This is what's crazy about it, and I didn't even know that he said this stuff until Naheem was reading it. Back in the 20s, Hubert Harrison is saying, the Negro, the American Negro is going to deal with his shit here, and the African is going to have to deal with his shit over there. Like it's and that's exactly what it's been. Even when the Africans come here, the majority of these people don't get involved in the things that we go through. Right. I, I grew up in New York City going going to protests and rallies and demonstrations and marches and shit like that. You know, for the most part, the only people that would really participate in those things was Jamaicans and sometimes Puerto Ricans. I the Africans, experience. the Africans. Most of them is in this the, in the area like 116th Street. They're starting to move now throughout Harlem. You have different pockets of Africans throughout Harlem and shit. But the majority of them people stayed out of our stuff. Stayed out of our two, stuff. Two things. Uh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Let me let me just jump in. Hold on. I, I gotta jump in, and then you can come back. I gotta add, because I, I brought you on. Well, it was a bunch of comments you made, but the civil rights thing. The civil rights comment you made. Uh, I want you to still respond, but I, I need to know because we, we we getting late into the hours. But I need to know what does civil rights mean. So I'm not, I, I can't give you a, a textbook definition, but I'm so give you so this is what this is what I'm saying, right? And there's a reason why I asked that question because when you ask people what civil rights mean that are against civil rights that say that civil rights won't work etc cetera, etc cetera, 
they don't know what it means at all, right? So look, this is what we're gonna do because this is be the power. If you watch our intro, the intro says class is in session. So I wanna read civil, then I wanna read right. Civil, adjective, relating to ordinary citizens and their concerns as distinct from military or ecclesiastical matters. So civil, in, in, in this sense, is showing us by definition, not just some ideology you think attaches to Martin Luther King Jr. No, I got three I, I, I got it. Hold on. Whom I'm guessing you're probably against because you're with this pan African no, ideology. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, wait, hold on. I, I'm, okay, cool. All right, all right, cool. So let, now let's, let's rewrite. Right. That which is morally correct just or honorable to a moral or legal entitlement to have or obtain something or to act in a certain way. So what is the legal entitlement? Entitlement is laid out in the Declaration of Independence when it says that all men are created equal and that they have unalienable rights. This is that legal entitlement that we as citizens, civil, Right, our concerns, tax paying citizens, tax paying citizens at that. So when you when you come up here, number one, please come prepared. That's for anybody listening in. Make sure you got your ducks lined up in a row. And we're not doing this to necessarily embarrass anybody, but to show that we need all of our freedmen thinking on the same page. I pray, brother, that you go back and watch this and say, damn, I was I was wrong on a whole lot of stuff. No, you I'm not, might I'm not, not embarrassed in the, in the least, but I have no, two more uh, things I want to say. No, doubt, I got you. And you might not feel it in the moment, but when you think about the very simple definition of civil rights, you couldn't even give us a, a breakdown of that, and yet you're against it. It's like the people that's against the vaccine. They couldn't tell you the first thing in it besides the uh, micro, the baby uh, nano microchips, which is not in it. You see what I'm saying? These people just running off of what other people have said and ideologies, in your case, that stem all the way back to the early 1900s, brother. But go ahead. Okay, so the first thing is that uh, brother BTP Ali was saying that we, on a large scale, don't uh, deal with Africans or, or that when you were in New York, uh, Africans wouldn't be involved in our fights and our struggles. That's I have a fact. different experience. I come from a university town where we have many African people that come in. And anytime we had any type of uh, city council meeting, city, uh, anytime, you know, any type of fights that we were engaged in, because I was a youthful, I was a youth activist when I was younger. African people would be involved. There's also economic ties that we have with Africa. There's businesses that Black people engage in in the continent and doing business backwards and forwards. I, what I'm simply suggesting is, is that part of our agenda needs to be in increasing that, increasing our independence from this system, increasing our independence, increasing our ability to survive without having to beg anybody for anything. That's how, how are we going to increase our independence when a lot of the people over there in the continent can barely in, uh, uh, increase their independence? Do you know a lot of the value of those people dollars are, are dependent upon federal reserves way over in Europe? We talking about uh, African dollars with African Again, it's it, all about being money. It's all hold about on, being brother, because hold on. Do you know that you got they have money with African leaders and presidents on it, and a lot of that stuff is backed by uh, uh European foreign banks and foreign reserves? You follow what I'm saying? Because you, you keep talking about independence, like our independence is uh, uh determined by some type of relationship with Africa. You follow what I'm saying? And look, I don't have. I'm no not problem. saying it's determined by. I didn't I say it was have determined. No problem I didn't with, say it was uh, determined. That's not what I with said. African relationships, said. and I don't have no problem with 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 people dealing with Africa. You follow what I'm saying? But by far, 
the the interest the interest of african people and the struggles of african american people in this country is barely 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 recognizable brother and i hear what you say about your uh your experience you follow what i'm saying but the bottom line is that no let me tell you something man i, I had a family member that that married a nigerian and they have the Nigerian Association. You, we we went to the event or whatever, right? It's like come to the event. You know, we was invited by my family member to the event. You know, that was the coldest, driest event that I ever all uh, uh, went to because you know we weren't Nigerian and the people kind of felt like we were foreigners to to be participating in that event and, and treated us with like a cold shoulder. And I ain't mad at them for that. I mean, I was mad at them back in the day because I didn't really have that understanding. But like what Ali was basically insinuating, everybody keep talking about this whole Pan-Africanism thing like it's a savior to black people. And it's usually black people in America that's uh, pushing it, whether it's immigrant person from the islands. But we pushing it. But them people over there not pushing no 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 pan-african agenda and relationships with that because if that was the case this shit would have been achieved a long time ago it's simple right but I'm when sorry the brothers be talking about when the brothers talking about you apologizing for the africans let them apologize for themselves right exactly i haven't had that experience so i can't identify with being right, right. Or right. like i'm, so, but I, I'm talking about it like large. i'm not just talking about my experiences but I, i'm talking about just just the the experience in general of the negativity that a lot of our people sometimes even receive from uh black people overseas brother so and, and i'm not a hate of those people you know and the brothers will tell you none of us really like we don't hate hate those people but basically what we keep saying is that this whole concept of pan-africanism is basically being sold to us like it's a cure and it's not a cure to the issues that we have going on over here and and brother you know this whole you know and i understand we got issues and problems um in this country and that's what we working to fix we basically continuing the work of our ancestors and fixing the problems in our land here this can I agree with you on something? I'm about, to, I'm, about, I'm about to agree with you on something. Yeah, th this is our land that we need to be laboring for. So when you say civil rights is a failure, no, it's not a failure. They have been sabotages in the system, yes. And they are saboteurs that has uh, 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 sabotaged the, some of the things, and many of them look like us, but it wasn't a failure because basically man we, what they said from from here to what equality you follow what i'm saying we're talking about people who were beat raped maimed on the street you follow what i'm saying to create an aboriginal indigenous culture in this country amongst native black americans that is a light for everybody around the world brother you you, you follow you follow what i'm saying to you brother so yeah, I was about when to agree talk with you about pan-Africanism, when we're talking about pan-Africanism, you talking about an idea and a concept that has only been achieved in fantasy. While we have freedmen in this country that have moved the needle forward year after year after year for damn near the past 300 years. Where you at, Rob Bourne? I know you listening. Time, where you at, Rob Bourne? We because let me say real quick, Grim. Uh, I'll be noticing a lot of cats be wanting to have these debates on on um Clubhouse, you know, about Pan Africanism, and and my brother Rob Bourne has said some things about reparations, you know, in the in the Clubhouse crowd where you got a bunch of people that can shout you down. Uh, your sidekicks are not too too intelligent, you know. They could they get into these little uh circular arguments and and uh you know it, it's kind of corny but it is what it is but i i do want to get rob born up here for a debate on pan-africanism um i think that'll be a good 
good discussion because they believe in that. They believe that uh, Pan-Africanists were the ones that built up, not freedmen, American freedmen, but Pan-Africanists, people that had this ideology of Pan-Africanism. And they mentioned people like Martin Delaney, who was a Pan-Africanist until, the, uh, I believe it was the Civil War, broke out. And he was like, nah, F that. I'm, I'm fighting for my people. Forget that Africa stuff. I'll get back to that another time. My people need me to fight for, for them right now. So, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm calling Rob Bourne out. I just had to throw that out there. So it's, it's Go we're going on three hours, but we want you to go ahead, Doc Feelers. And then I know Ali, what brother Ali, want to say something. Go ahead, um, Doc Feelers. Uh, say your, your closing words, and then Ali going to respond. Okay. So what I agree with is that I never suggested that Pan Africanism is a panacea for all of our ills. I never suggested that Pan Africanism is the, is the solvent to all of our problems. What I'm saying is, is that in the same way that there were saboteurs to the civil rights movement, there were also saboteurs to the Pan-Africanist Pan movement as well. There's saboteurs in every movement that we try to make. What I'm saying is, is that if we're going to sit here and talk about Marcus Garvey, then we're going to have to talk about Booker T. Washington. We're going to have to talk about Ida B. Wells. We talk we're about Booker T. About, we, we, we yeah, about yeah, we did. We're going to have to talk about people who have said disparaging things about quote unquote freedmen. You understand what I'm saying? And what I'm saying is, is that we there's no we shouldn't take any option off the table. We shouldn't take any option off the table. We're not in a position to be like, I, I'm not going to uh, build relationships. Other people who fight for their rights don't do that. Other people who fight for their rights look for allies. You understand what I'm saying? So that's all we I have to have say. We I don't have a problem with that. If, if I come to discuss something with y'all, I'll make sure I have my ducks in a row. But no, <laughs> I don't feel I don't feel embarrassed or anything of the sort. And let me ask you a question. I, I, in fact, if you want to talk about civil rights, I, I grew up in the younger civil rights movement up under you know, uh, some of the, the major players in the civil rights movement. So, I, you know, I got to meet all of these people, at, you know, and I, I organized events with civil rights leaders, you know, back when uh, Willie Ricks, you know what I mean? We're talking about, uh, what's the brother's name? Uh, Kwame Touri before he passed away. You know, I, I introduced some of these civil rights movement people to younger to a younger generation. So I, yeah, I'm but not, we was going. That, that's what we were saying, brother. That we believe I'm that not a lot of these people or, or have a misunderstanding of what civil rights was. I'm just saying I'm not going to give you a textbook. yeah. But but what we were saying was that a lot of these people, like Kwame Ture, they they were the mission drift, brother. They should have got with King and stayed with King. They developed under King and then but branched Willie, off. Willie Ricks is, is from America too. So but I'm, I'm know, talking I, about I, Kwame Ture. I'm, I don't know Willie Ricks. I'm not familiar with him. I'm you talking don't know about coining the term black power. No, I thought um uh, Kwame and Kuma, I mean not Kwame, um Kwame, <laughs> Kwame Torre coined that term, but they I mean, were together. Were the, they were roommates. They were the, okay. Then I, 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 I I'm I'm more for like that listen. You, you that's got me all on that brother one. is saying is that he he know Kwame Torre. He not familiar with the other brother. That's that, all. That's Just, it. Let's, let's move on. That's Definitely. that's irrelevant. Right, Definitely. and because right. we're not really pushers of we we were never really pushers of black power like that. So that's not that's not our thing. That's right. It's not that's our right. thing. We have a problem with blackness. We we can go into that at another time. So so okay. anyway, um, let me ask you 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 have a degree. You, you call yourself Doc Phillips. You're a doctor for real, for real. Oh no no no, that's just a pseudonym. That's just a pseudonym. Oh, okay okay. Now I was gonna ask what you what's your special you know. No doubt, man. I appreciate you coming on, though, man. Um, so at the end of the day, I think the bottom line for us is that, you know, as like like Brother Grimm said, as descendants of the people who were fighting here, we it's our it's our obligation. It's our duty to continue to fight. We can't like drop the ball. And one of the things that I noticed that we've done and I've said said this on a number of occasions since Dr. King's death and the put down of the Black Panther Party. Who were who were political, the um, the 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 you know putting the Black Panther Party down and, and murdering Dr. King from that period, man, we really haven't been able to achieve much of anything, right? And and I think what they did was by 
taking down the Black Panther Party and murdering Dr. King is it killed the spirit of our people. And I think that we have to get that fighter spirit back. It ain't about fleeing. See, the, one of the problems with a lot of the Pan-Africanists is they keep trying to direct us towards Africa. And that's that saying, and, and this goes back to what we were talking about with Marcus Garvey, this whole sentiment of let's cut and run because whatever we were doing here, it ain't working. We need to go and try to re, you know, repatriate to Africa or some, some crap like that. That's not part of our, that's not part of our legacy. We, that's not what we've done in mass. You had some people went to Liberia, some people went to early on, some people went to the large majority of us was here. And, and we, we fought here for advancements and whatever little, however you want to look at them, you know, here. And we've always, like the sisters just said, the fighting spirit. That was our spirit. We we never in mass cut and run. We didn't try to try to do that. That's not our thing. And so when other people from outside come in trying to tell everybody that we need to cut and run, like it's a reason why black people didn't in mass leave with Garvey, when Garvey was saying we should all go back to Africa. They're not going to do that because that's not really what black Americans want to do. Their home is here. Their businesses are here. Their cars are here. Their families are here. Everything is here. We ain't, what are we going to do? Uproot everything and go to start all over from scratch in some, some other country that doesn't have land set aside for us. They don't have an economy for us. They don't have nothing for us. What are, they gonna, what are we going to do? Indeed. And, and I, I want to say, and for all those people who believe that, if they believe that Pan-Africanism is, is basically the cure-all, for everything and going back to Africa is it? Leave. Don't stay here 20 years, 30 years, 40 more fucking years, right? Expatriate. Expatriate now. Been Heaven telling people that. Waiting. Heaven is awake. Go there now. If you're not an American citizen or that you think that this country is the worst place that you can be, leave. What, what, let me show y'all something. <laughs> What did the George Floyd uh, uh, situation reveal about uh, police brutality, right? I'm going to show you all something about freedmen. Like the sister said, the fighting spirit. When the freedmen and stuff started fighting and protesting uh, uh, over the death of George Floyd, what did that do? That, that movement influenced black people all over Africa, right? Mm. And guess what? Guess who started talking about their uh, uh, police brutality? Nigerians. That's right. And 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 they they killed over two hundred something people in Nigeria. This ain't no colonialist doing this, right? This was their own fucking people. That's right. And all of the Nigerians, when the, when the black people in America stood up for George Floyd. All of the black people in Africa and Nigeria started standing up against the SARS unit, the what they call it, the uh the special anti-robbery squad that was going around beating and brutal uh, brutalizing Nigerians. So they're having a, a police brutality problem in Nigeria too. So when they saw us rise up, they rose up against their own police brutality in their own uh country. The whole country of young people stood up against their own black police force that was brutalizing them. But Pan-Africanism is the is the cure to that shit. Y'all, y'all follow, y'all follow what I'm saying? We follow y'all see the yep. irony in that. That's right. You follow what I'm saying? Y'all want us to go over there and they police kicking their ass too. You know, hey. it, 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 we gaining ground over here. Right. And it's like you made me think about what I said earlier. I don't know if Doc Phyllis heard this part, but earlier we was talking about the the, the actual insanity of, of Garvey's Back to Africa movement in the 1920s when the whole continent was colonized. These people were under colonial power. Like, so right. it just didn't make no damn so sense. The reason, why you know I said what I, the reason why I said what I said was is that how can we, and I, I rewrote it later on, is how can we claim that quote unquote, they didn't want Marcus Garvey in that country when that country was not controlled by African people. You understand what I'm saying? 
So well, the same power that we're talking about, colon colonists, the same powers that we're talking about, did not want. What do you? So let me let me ask you all a question. You think there's no fear throughout the whole world of a unified black people? There's no fear of a unified black people throughout the world. It, it, I'm it, sure. It, I'm it sure it is. is. I'm sure it is. Absolutely. I'm sure it is. So I wouldn't you don't think that would have had anything to do with why Marcus Garvey was not allowed in certain places. Well, it's possible. Marcus, I, I don't we know. have to take a look at Marcus Garvey's personal life, man. And after Marcus Garvey went back to uh to Jamaica, by by the time before he went to England, Marcus Garvey, man, back basically lost everything he had. Not only did he lost everything he had, he went to his wife's savings and spent all her shit. You understand what I'm saying? So so basically, man, you and uh, I think he had wrote to his friends that he'll never go back to Jamaica. And he he said he left Jamaica a broken man. Then he went to England and then got involved in, in black Englishman politics. You follow what I'm saying? We we're not saying that they they don't fear uh black people coming together all over the world. But what we 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 talking about <laughs> is the issues that Marcus Garvey had that basically made him null and void as the leader to do that right that's a you fact know what I'm saying? He, he didn't have the capacity to do that he didn't have the capacity to do it no all, all, all his business dealings and stuff ended up Fail. being failures, failures man the, his house they, they gave him i think like 10 grand the people that you and ira raised for him when he went back to jamaica he bought a big old giant uh house mansion and land or whatever before it was all over with, that shit was foreclosed on. But in, in the same way that I, I'm not suggesting that Pan-Africanism is a panacea for all of the problems of the black world, I'm also not suggesting that any one person can create a philosophy that's going to govern everybody in every specific situation throughout the world. I'm saying the tenets, though, the, the understanding that we have more power unified than separated it has to be part so of So let me, let me, okay, no okay, way. let me jump There's in. No let me way. jump in. Let me ask you a question. How does the, for instance, Louisiana just got hit by a major hurricane, Ida, right? We did a fundraiser right here on Be the Power. We helped out several families. I actually, the sister actually contacted me today. The, the first sister we did the fundraiser for. Uh, you know, her story is getting out there just to give everybody an update. Um, so I think she received a couple donations from some some agents. I got to read the text. I just forgot when I got back in the crib to do so, to read it thoroughly. But um, how does unity with African nations help the people in Louisiana when the American government failed at that's, doing their that's job, a, that's an easy answer. That's an easy answer. Okay, it well, that's, it that's the it. point of what I'm saying. Go ahead. Oh, uh, then what? I, okay, wait a minute. That's the point of what I'm saying. The it point doesn't. of what you're I'm, saying. Wait, I thought unity was supposed to be the thing that helps us. It's one of the things. See, you're missing what I'm saying. It's one. I said a tool belt. It has to be part of our tool belt. As uh, it's one of the things that helps us. I'm saying okay. we should not, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to re-say the same thing I said before. We should not take any option off the table, is what I'm saying. So there's going to be, uh, again, I'm going to say the same thing I said before. There's going to be different situations in, where we land throughout the diaspora where we're not going to be able to assist ourselves by being paid. Right. Okay? But, but somebody said they're not going to do nada. Here's the thing. You said taking options off the table. Africa helping us is not an option. Africa, African nations, and I, I used to say from the time period that we was fighting in the Civil War forward, they didn't, they never tried to help us do anything. But some people said, well, they were under colonialism and they was dealing with their own things. Fine. Okay. Some, from the 50s and 60s, when they all started to gain independence from European powers, they've done nothing to try to help us. These people haven't done anything to try to help us. I hear people all the time talk about you need to, we, we should try to start investing in Africa. Why should we, as a small group of people in the United States, largely, invest, wealthless. largely wealthless, invest in a continent 
that has 50 something nation states, governments, economies, whole citizens, citizenships, citizenries, everything, right? They got all militaries, the police, they got all the stuff that they need. Uh, they got seats on us, the uh, uh, they got the, seats uh, in UN Council, United, uh, United, United Nations Nation seats, all of this, right? These are actual nation states, they want. You froze up, Ali. All right. Well, Ali froze up, froze right. up on us. So look, this is what I want to do. I, I pull this up all the time. How much foreign aid the world receives from the United States? Okay, let's go through it. Ethiopia, 1.1 billion. And uh this is US foreign aid by country, right? So this article comes from the U.S. aid from American people. H, well, I guess you could punch in uh, www. Oh no, that's a whole long URL down there at the bottom. Let me see if I could maybe somebody will capture that because I'm not going to try to read through all of that. So let's let's go through this because I don't understand these arguments anymore because the more you know the more you grow which is why we bring these things out ethiopia receives 1.1 billion dollars in aid annually from the united states sudan 924 million the democratic republic of congo 494 million benin 419 million hell even haiti receives 307 million Malawi, Mali, Liberia, Uganda, Tanzania, Somalia, Mozambique, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, 852 million, right? So we see all of Zambia, all of these African countries are receiving aid from the United States of America. How is it that we are making a push to fight colonialism by this pretended unity? that we should somehow amass our resources together globally when when these african nations rely on aid from the united states of america i'm not asking this question to you brother it's a rhetorical question i'm hoping that you go you you know go back listen to this and slowly but surely abandon the ideas that you have. And I'm going to be bold enough to tell you that. You know why, brother? Because we had to do the same exact things. We came up in Garveyisms, Noble Drew Aliisms, Elijah Muhammadisms, Pan-Africanisms. We came, <coughs> a lot of what you've said tonight, brother, we were saying that stuff 10, 12 years ago. Hell, probably even six, seven years ago. <laughs> You see, there's an elevation of the education. The more you know, the better you understand, especially when it comes to our particular plight as a people. So that's why we can bring somebody on and try our best to school them up. The debates and arguments in school. And we know that you're fighting from your position. So it's hard to just say, all right, y'all right. Yeah, right. This has been a position that you've stood on for a long time. So we understand that. Only thing we can hope is that you would go back and watch this part, where, especially where you came on. Hell, watch the whole thing to gain an understanding of why we're saying what we're saying, that we need to move away from these fantastical ideas and thinking because they uh, um, unground us, if, if that's a term from being grounded in what we need to be grounded in. And Garvey and Drew Ali and all of these different people that came, they took us off the path of political power, which is why we are in the position that we are in now. And the only thing many of, have le uh, many of us have left is aspirationalism, to whereas we aspire to be rich like celebrities so we try to live vicariously through them the other aspect is this african thing right where we just in, imagine 
Africa being uh, Wakanda, basically, where there's a bunch of vibranium and we can make vibranium weapons and take over the world and conquer white supremacy. It doesn't happen that way. But if we can get our political house in order, one of the plans, <clears throat> for instance, that we're developing, brother, is that we want to move all of our... No, no, Ali is not in the joint. That we want to move all of our people, as many as we can, back to the South so that we could have numerical majorities. There was a book written on it right here. Get this book, brother. Read it. Read it. The Devil You Know by Charles M. Blow. Read this book. It's, it's a resource, right? Some people tell us to read stuff, and it's usually about pan-Africanist ideas that, that the pan-African who wrote it didn't never accomplish. This is something that we can accomplish because there's precedence for it. That's why Bernie Sanders is, is still the senator in Vermont because a group of hippies back in, I think, the 60s or the 70s, which this brother highlights in this book, decided that they were going to go to Vermont. They slept in tent cities, but they got out there and they became a political majority out there. Many of them people are blatant racist. That's why Bernie Sanders is against reparations. If he comes out in favor of it, he knows that his electorate is going to vote him out for somebody more favorable to their bigoted liking. Now, imagine, brother, you said you're in Alabama. I'm not in Alabama, but that's where I'm from. But you from Alabama? Where you where where you're at right now? If you don't mind telling us, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, so you right down here where I'm at right now. So my thing is, if you just seen Georgia flip blue, with Georgia flipped blue because of the vote of the freedmen and and other groups, of course, but it was largely that freedmen vote. Imagine if we can flood our people in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana, bring more into Georgia, South Carolina, now we start to control our politics. And that situation at the border never, ever happens with the Haitians. Because somebody said we're xenophobes. We're not xenophobes. We're just freedmen first. So I, I want to thank you, brother, for coming on and being bold enough to come on. A lot of people you, be bro. ducking and smoke. Like that one brother in the chat, Barutu, whatever it is. His or her name was, you know, but you was able, you were willing to come on. Uh, we did you feel disrespected by any of us? No, not at all. Nah, right? You know, um, maybe misunderstood, but no, not, not <laughs> okay. disrespected. No Sorry. doubt, <laughs> no doubt, no we doubt. So look, you, doc. definitely, Thank definitely. You, told, yo, we gonna close it out. So peace, brother. Thanks for coming on, man. Salute. All right, peace. <clears throat> so, Grim, you <clears throat> excuse me. You want to take us up out of here with, with you know, with a, a recap and. Whew, man, I, I just want to say, you know, we got a flag, man. Like. I was I was hesitant to actually do this show, you know, like because I was a follower of Marcus Garvey. I was a member of the UNIA. Um, I was a member of the Morris Science Temple. I've been the, studied the teachers of the Nation of Islam. I mean, you know, so you it's it's not like uh you know, you got some crazy agent dudes talking about this stuff. You know, me and Naheem came up through these schools, you know. Uh uh Naheem uh 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 five percent, you know, nation, you know. I mean, we come up and, and when we studied, we was masters at that stuff. We just weren't no members. So, you know, man, but anyway, to go to the park, man. Y'all see this flag behind me, man. It's the Juneteenth flag. This the flag we fly. It's not the red, black, and green flag. You know, I don't fly that flag no more after I learned what it really represent in, in Garvey's a, a affinity and his admiration for the, you know, the Irish uh, uh, movements and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? So this is what I fly behind me. And there's also another flag that they call the Black American flag, which is red and black. With the with the broadsword in it, which is uh uh for basically my um my icon picture that you see right here. So we got the a black American flag. You follow what I'm saying to you? You know this flag right here. We got Juneteenth, June 19th, 1865, which is a new era of time now. 
<laughs> and I even know what I'm talking about when I say that. That's right. And, and basically, man, we 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 were long overdue for this critique of Garvey because we knew it. You know, I knew it would make people mad. I wasn't comfortable with it. But when we when I sat down and I talked with the brothers, and we was basically going in and, and sharing some of these things, what Hubert Harrison said. I mean, man, if it to for me, if A. Philip Randolph said something about this man i mean man i mean hot when you look at a philip randolph's life and uh a lot of those freedmen lives and stuff like that man these weren't people you know i was kind of skeptical about the garvey and uh uh du dubois uh uh debates and stuff like that man but for me man that that whole a philip randolph going against him man that that basically did it for me man because we we not talking about nobody that's just vying for for power over the hearts and the minds of the freedmen. We talking about people who were actually trying to make us free. These people weren't no no. Agents. Let, let me let me let me. I want to interject real quick, Grim, right? Because you brought up a Philip Randolph and Garvey, and and I brought up Hubert Harrison, and I want to just say what Hugh, what A. Philip Randolph, who critiqued Garvey, A. Philip Randolph was a freedman. Hubert Harrison was a Caribbean, right? But look at what A. Philip Randolph said of Hubert Harrison. It says, um, Hubert Harrison was described by activist A. Philip Randolph as the father of Harlem radicalism and by the historian Joel Augustus Rogers as the foremost African, <clears throat> this J.A. Rogers, the foremost African-American intellect of his time. John G. Jackson of the American Atheist described him as the black Socrates. And even he had a critique of Marcus Garvey. Yeah, go ahead, Grim. I, I just wanted to interject that point. Indeed, man. And, 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 and uh, you know, like I said, we, we got a flag, you know, and I, uh, Man, for like what you were saying, brother, for uh 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 you know, for me, man, like when A. Philip Randolph was saying what he was saying, I was basically done with the whole issue, and I was comfortable enough to come out and basically finish it and 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 uh do the critique. Now, as far as like the, the history and knowledge of our people and where we come from and knowing who we are. You know, man, we ain't need Elijah, Drew Ali, and Garvey for that because the freedmen was already teaching that. Moses Dixon was already teaching that. Jay Rogers, you know, we always talk about more, and, and then we put Noble Drew Ali in his old shitty ass 60-page pamphlet like, like it gave us all knowledge and wisdom, but most of the history that we got about the Moors and stuff like that come from people like, uh, 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 What's this brother name right here? Light and Truth, Robert Benjamin Robert Lewis, Benjamin a Freeman. Lewis, that's right. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, also uh, uh, J.A. Rogers. You know, we we kick them people on the side, then we'll give a noble Drew Ali plot of props when uh, uh, J.A. Rogers give an exhaustive breakdown of 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 of, of uh, uh, African uh, history. In, in ancient history of our people and this relation, the Moors, all that stuff. But then we'll hold this uh, punk ass nigga named Noble Drew Ali up as some holy and divine prophet, you know? And uh, uh, and, and, and Garvey and, and all of these, and Elijah Muhammad and stuff like that, when they had freedmen, even though Elijah was a freedman, Drew was a freedman, but they were a mission drift. But we had freedmen that was giving us the esoteric knowledge of our of our history, the things that was hidden from us who were born right amongst us is freedom. So, man, everything we got, our freedmen ancestors gave it to us. We don't need no mission drift. We don't need no uh, 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 people coming in uh, trying to make us Orientals and all of that kind of stuff, man, telling us that we Asiatics and we Moroccans and we this, we that. Man, we got the Freedman history, man. The Freedman knowledge. You follow what I'm saying? If you want to know, go get this book, Light and Truth. You follow what I'm saying? We are the Freedman. That's who we are. 
That's why we was designated in 1865, which really became the new era in time for the That's free. right. You follow what I'm saying? Bro, we, we got everything that we need right here amongst the freemen. We got Shy Town. We got Motown. We got the culture. You know, we, we took the elements of the rice and the okra. We made uh, like the brother that was on that, that documentary we talked about. Black people in America, the only people in the world that has a cuisine named after something that's just transcend, transcendental mm. and spiritual. We call mm. it what? Soul, Soul food. food. We the only people in the world that got that, man. You follow what I'm saying? So I don't want to ramble on. Freeman first. Peace and blessings. Yeah. Woo. Man, tonight was a powerful, powerful program. I love it because we are closing up every escape hatch. We're not even closing up the escape hatches. We are pulling up to the escape hatches with cement trucks, opening them up and filling them with cement so that they could never, ever be retreated to again. That's what we do here at Be The Power. And it is simple as that. So, you know, Freedmen first, y'all already know. I leave y'all with the motto of the platform, which is don't just fight the power, become the power. And then, and only then, will you have the power to make a change with that. I say peace.